Number five on this list is the Dancing Plague of 1518. That's right guys, you heard that right. A plague about dancing. Honestly, I'd never heard of this before and in my whole time working on this channel, this is actually the coolest and strangest thing that I've ever come across. So in Strasbourg, Alsace, which is now modern day France, in the year 1518, from July all the way to September, People just started dancing. For months, hundreds of people were dancing in the streets of France and they couldn't stop. It's said that one woman started dancing in the streets one day and then some more came and they just kept going for months with absolutely no reason at all. People started thinking that this was the cause of a demonic possession or some ghost that was making people lose their minds, but in actuality, nobody had any idea why these people were doing this. This wasn't a casual waltz either. These people were going hard. These people went so hard that they literally danced themselves to death. I can't possibly imagine going so hard at the club that I died, but that's basically what happened here with these people. There are actual claims that at one point in the heat of all this dancing, up to 15 people were dying per day just from dancing. This death kept happening and these people would continue dancing around all of these bodies. This plague went on until September when it just suddenly subsided and that was that. No explanation, no reasoning behind it, they just went hard for several months and then stopped. That's why everyone thinks that something demonic has to be the cause of all this. Some people have speculated that food poisoning may have played some role, but that just doesn't make any sense to me because it went on for months. Seriously folks, please comment down below what you think about this or some theories about why this happened because it has me pretty baffled. Number 4 on this list is the lost city of Atlantis. Atlantis is a city that is considered to be a utopian society in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. It was first documented by Plato in two of his works, Timaeus and Chryseis. Now even though Atlantis is often referred to as a city these days, back then Plato described it as an island. This island was located in the Atlantic and was said to be pretty massive, bigger than Asia Minor and Libya combined. This island, or city, was extremely wealthy and had a surplus of resources. This is what led them to being considered a utopia and a highly advanced group. Now Plato describes a great battle between these Atlanteans and the Athenians and says that after lots of hard fighting, the Athenians eventually prevailed in the war. Then several massive earthquakes caused the earth to shift and the entire island of Atlantis was swallowed up by the sea and now rests at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean somewhere. Many people have speculated on how accurate these tales from Plato are with experts believing that this could just all be a myth. However, the legend of Atlantis started to circulate around Europe many years later and people began searching for this lost city. Nobody has found it to this day, but that doesn't mean that it never existed. Maybe we're just thinking about it the wrong way. Some people have thought that this entire city of Atlantis could have been aliens coming down to Earth and that potentially this island was never really an island to begin with. Plato does describe the society as being a utopia and an explanation for that would be aliens that have far better technology than we do. Maybe when this island apparently disappeared, these aliens just left. Now that does beg the question, if they're so advanced, how on earth could the ancient Athenians beat them in a battle, which I do think is a very fair point. I do believe that Plato and the people after him have exaggerated this story and the full truth has probably been lost in history. But I also believe that this tale didn't just come out of nowhere and something potentially paranormal could be at hand. Number three on this list is the Coral Castle. The Coral Castle is a limestone structure located in Florida. It is super unique and has these strange limestone rocks that have been carved into various figures. Now there's nothing inherently cursed about this place. However, similar to the pyramids or Stonehenge that we covered in our last video, people wonder how on earth this place was made. Edward Leeds Scallon was a self-taught Russian engineer who came to America. He lived from 1887 to 1951 and is credited with being the creator of the Coral Castle. What's absolutely crazy about this story though, is he constructed the structure all by himself. This is what baffles people to this day. How on earth is it possible that one man in the early 1900s was capable of moving these limestones and carving them the way that they are single handedly? These stones weigh thousands of pounds and there's no way that a man would ever be able to lift these things with sheer strength. Now he was an engineer and people have speculated that it was potentially the use of magnetism, something that he was fascinated with in his life. When asked how he was able to do this, he replied, I understand the laws of weight and leverage and I know the secrets of the people who built the pyramids. This kind of makes sense, but with the pyramids, they had thousands of people working on them all at once. You were only one man. 
People have theorized that Edward actually had some supernatural abilities that he was hiding from the public. This could honestly be believable because his personality was apparently extremely eccentric and very strange. However Edward was able to construct the Coral Castle, it truly is remarkable. Number 2 on this list is the oldest ghost story of all time. Ever wonder when all this started? When did humans start believing in ghosts or when did we have our first encounter with a poltergeist? Well a 3,500 year old tablet may have the earliest depiction of a ghost as we know them today. This is a small tablet that was made in ancient Babylon and is considered by some experts to be one of the first, if not the first, written depiction of a ghost. The ghostly drawings could be easily missed and you have to really pay attention if you're going to see it. An expert on the subject, Irvin Finkel says, you'd probably never give it a second thought because the area where the drawings are looks like it's got no writing, but when you examine it and hold it under a lamp, those figures leap out at you across time in the most startling way. The tablet goes into detail on how to get rid of ghosts and calls for an exorcist. It explains how this exorcist must make figurines of a man and a woman and also speak the words of Mesopotamian god Shemesh to get rid of the ghost. There's also a warning to the reader to not turn around, potentially an indicator that a ghost could be behind you or you could risk getting sucked into the underworld if your focus isn't steady. This tablet also lists a bunch of materials that can be used in rituals and that can be used to prevent ghosts from appearing in the first place. This is super interesting because it means that ghosts and spirits visiting the living can be traced all the way back to the ancient Mesopotamians. We were having paranormal events happen to us thousands of years ago and the action of exercising demons and ghosts. It all started with these guys. One could argue that they were the founders and innovators of a lot of our ghostly practices and knowledge to this day. Number one on this list is Oak Island. Oak Island is a very mysterious island that has been shrouded in lore for years. It's a privately owned island off the south shore of Nova Scotia, Canada. It has so many rumors surrounding it that it's even got its own television show called The Curse of Oak Island that has 8 seasons under its belt. This is a reality television show by the History Channel where they explore the mysteries of Oak Island and considering they're on season 8 it's fair to say that there have been quite a few mysteries. The one that's gained the most international fame though is the Money Pit. The Money Pit is supposedly a place on Oak Island where there's a plethora of buried treasure waiting for somebody to dig it up. This treasure was left by the pirate Captain William Kidd who lived from 1645 to 1701. There's said to be vast riches here, however no one's been able to find it up until this point. This is largely because finding buried treasure can be extremely difficult, but also due to the curse that surrounds it. The curse that hovers over this treasure states that seven men will die in search of the treasure before it's found. To this day there have actually been six deaths associated with this buried treasure. That means that if one more person was to die whilst they're looking for it, then the treasure would either reveal itself or the next person who goes looking for it would be the one who finds it. Problem with this is that there's one more person who needs to die and I don't think that anyone wants to be that unlucky number 7. Other than this pirate treasure there's also rumored to be some extremely valuable and mystical items here. Never before seen Shakespearean plays, the holy grail and the ark of the covenant have all been linked to Oak Island. If searching for cursed treasure is your cup of tea, and this is definitely the place for you. Kicking off at number 5, the Donna Reed Party. Now it's a given fact that throughout the history of the colonization of North America, there are countless recorded tales of bleak misfortune and murderous misery, but one of the most famous accounts is that of the renowned Oregon Trail and one of the most infamous groups of pioneers to ever walk it, the Donna Reed Party. However in an even more grim revelation, the one word that first springs to mind in this instance is cannibalism. You see during the 1840s the fledgling United States saw a massive increase in pioneers, particularly people who had left their traditional homes in the east to settle the newly founded Oregon Territory and California. In the bright and hopeful spring of 1846 almost 500 wagons departed from Independence Missouri including the wealthy Reed and Donna family forming a massive wagon train bound for the new territory. However by July the Donna Reed party had received word of a new trail that would get them to their destination quicker. Given to them by a pioneer adventurer named Lansford W Hastings. Trusting Hastings would ultimately be the worst mistake that the party made and despite protests from some, the party split off from the main wagon trail and headed into the Wasatch Mountains. Eventually though, the unexplored and relentless landscape proved merciless to the party and they quickly became split off from each other over weeks and months of hardship. The party were beset upon by accidental gunshot deaths, malnutrition, grizzly bears, whiteouts and blizzards and by February 
February the 19th, the true extent of their misfortune was realized by the outside world. The party were finally found at Truckee Lake. 41 of them had died, and the other 46 had resorted to eating the dead just to survive. And all of that because of a supposed shortcut. Sometimes it seems it's best to stay on the beaten path. Coming in at number 4, the Darien Scheme. Now although I'm a huge advocate for the majestic people and picturesque peaks of the Caledonian Kingdom of Scotland, noble explorers and brave adventurers in their own right, it's safe to say that in early history they weren't exactly known for their feats in exploring the southern places of the Americas. And there may be a reason for that. The doomed expedition of the Darien Scheme, a ploy conjured up in the mid 1690s to get Scotland into the newly surging worldwide economic trading game. And where did they set their sights? Panama, of course. In 1698, five ships filled with 1200 people set sail from the eastern coast to avoid detection by British warships as the East India Company didn't exactly take kindly to any competition of commerce. Villains. And on November the 2nd, 1698, they successfully landed off the coast of their destination without a hitch. The settlers aptly christened their new home, New Caledonia and all was well. That's until they realised that none of them had absolutely any idea how to live in the Caribbean, never mind set up a trading post. First up they decided to spend all of their energy constructing a fort in an area with no fresh water supply, and many of them quickly succumbed to dehydration. Then they decided to go to the back breaking effort of setting up fields to grow maize and yams, which they didn't have any idea how to do either, or even had access to the crops in the first place. Because they didn't know how to store food in the burning heat of Panama, little food that they did manage to gather quickly spoiled and dysentery, fever and rot spread throughout the fort. In the end, out of 1200 settlers, only 300 survived the ordeal, with many more dying on the return ship back. And in January of the year 1700, they completely abandoned the colony, and when they returned to Scotland, the few survivors were disowned by their families and considered a disgrace to the entire country. <sighs> Yikes. Next up at number 3, the Percy Fawcett Expedition. Percy Fawcett, what a name, and with a name like that you'd think that nothing could ever go awry, twirling his beautiful moustache and smoking a pipe as he surged across the seven seas in his hot air balloon. But unfortunately for Percy, that same headstrong British gumption was exactly what spelled his ruin, although the actual fact of the matter remains, no one truly knows the ultimate fate of Percy Fawcett, and it is rumoured that over 100 people have died in 13 separate attempts just to learn exactly what happened to him. So, what's the big deal? Well, Percy was a member of the British Royal Geographical Society, and he was convinced that somewhere in the deep jungles of the Amazon lay a legendary golden palace of riches ripe for the picking that he referred to as the Lost City of Zed. And so, after the First World War had ended, on April the 20th, 1925, Percy, his eldest son Jack, and his friend Raleigh set off into the jungle alongside two Brazilian guides, two horses, eight mules, and two dogs. They would never be seen again and the last known correspondence was a letter written by Fawcett to his wife sent by a runner from the remote dead horse camp. Now there are a multitude of rumours surrounding the ultimate fate of Percy Fawcett, but the fact of the matter remains that we very well may truly never know. One of the most accepted rumours is that the group met an ill fate at the hands of an unknown Amazonian tribe, although it is widely known that Percy Fawcett kept in good standing with the majority of the tribal people. Others claim that Percy never truly intended to return to Britain, and in instead already had knowledge of the lost city of Zed, where he planned to create a commune with his son and live out the rest of his days. Who knows, maybe one day another brave explorer will stumble upon the lost city of Zed, and the final resting place of Percy Fawcett will finally be discovered. Spooky. Although I've seen enough Indiana Jones movies to know that if there is a golden temple in the jungles of the Amazon, it's probably full of giant boulders and walls upon walls of poison spears. Nah. Next up at number 2, Franklin's Lost Expedition. Of course, because much like with our opening clip, we can't outline a list of the scariest cursed expeditions in history without acknowledging one of the most horrifying tales of remote isolation in the frozen icy flows of the Arctic Circle. Led by Captain Sir John Franklin, the expedition departed from England in 1845. A total of 129 men spread across two ships, HMS Erebus and HMS Terror, with the ultimate intention of navigating the legendary final section of the Northwest Passage, an unexplored area of the 
the frozen north. From the off, the expedition was met with brutal hardship, and after suffering a few early fatalities, the two ships became icebound in the Victoria Strait, unable to move in the remote territory of what is now known as Nunavut. That was their last known recorded location. In 1848, three years later, the first search party had been launched after a campaign by Franklin's wife, and in 1850, the first relics of the doomed expedition were found. The rough, shallow graves of three crewmen buried off the east coast of Beachy Island. Later, however, in 1854, an explorer by the name of John Ray found evidence of a few malnutrition survivors told to him by local Inuit. When the bones of the survivors were finally analysed, cut marks were found pointing towards signs of cannibalism and starkly suggesting that the 129 men resorted to eating each other out in the frozen wastes just to prolong their suffering. Help would never come. In total, it is thought that the two ships were trapped in the ice for a total of one year and seven months before the men wandered even deeper into the frozen sea, searching for hope that they would never ever find. Despite the misery and ruin of the expedition, in actual fact, it proved to map enough of the landscape to suffice discovery of the coveted Northwest Passage. The ultimate price, though, were the lives of everyone on board. And finally, our number one spot, the Lost Roanoke Colony. And the truth of the matter is, the haunting tale of the Lost Roanoke Colony isn't just one cursed expedition, but a number of them spread out across five fateful years, during a time when the Americas were first being colonised by England. Now, many of you may already know the tale of the Lost Roanoke Colony, and hundreds of theories have permeated their way across our culture over countless generations, but still, it serves to be one of the most mysterious and unexplained occurrences in Western history. The expedition and subsequent founding of the colony was first sponsored by the legendary explorer Sir Walter Raleigh, although fittingly, he himself vowed to never set foot in it. And so, in the summer of 1585, the first colony was attempted on the small Roanoke Island off the coast of what is today's Dare County in North Carolina. And quickly, things turned south after a lack of supplies in the area and bad relations with the local Native Americans. Many of the English colonists then left with Drake, but a few resolute pioneers stayed behind, determined to carve a new life for themselves. Later, in 1857, a new expedition arrived, headed by John White, who would later become the colony's governor. When they made their way to the new colony, though, the only thing they found were the skeletal remains of one of the colonists. Ah, bad sign. Right? Well, in fact, they decided to settle Roanoke again, this time with a larger party of around 145 colonists. John White sailed for England once again in the later summer of 1587, leaving the colony to flourish. But when he returned in 1590, he was greeted by the same familiar sight. Nothing. No one. In fact, not a trace of the 90 men, 17 women, and 11 children he had left behind. There were no signs of struggle, no remains of damage. In fact, the only clue was a single word carved into a fence post. Croatoan. Whew. Well, I'm sure you guys have got your own theories about the Lost Roanoke Colony, and if you do, make sure to let us know in the comment section down below. Number five on this list is the two-headed dog. This truly is a chilling story of one of the most well-known mad scientists in all of history. Vladimir Demikov was a Russian scientist who was fascinated with transplantology. Just how Dr. Zeus would make up words, well, our mad scientist did the same with transplantology. He coined the term and brought the world's attention to his very questionable experiments. He had become rather successful at transplanting organs between his favorite test subject, dogs. Giving one dog the organ of another dog and having that organ function, well this was new science back then. This part of his work has actually done wonders in medical science for humans, as now transplanting an organ or donating one after you pass away is commonplace. What he does next though hasn't done that much for our medical practices at all. and just raised a bunch of controversy. Vladimir wanted to push the envelope and go as far as he possibly could with his experiments. This is what led him to the two-headed dog. This picture was taken in 1959 and shows one larger host dog, a German Shepherd, with the head of another smaller dog sticking out of it. An article written by Aaron Kelly writes, Thanks to the team's wealth of experience, the operation took a mere three and a half hours. After the two-headed dog was resuscitated, both heads could hear, see, smell, and swallow. Although Shavka's transplanted head could drink, she was not connected to Brogan's stomach. 
Anything she drank flowed through an external tube and onto the floor. In the end, this two-headed dog lived only four days. Had a vein in the neck area not accidentally got damaged, it may have lived even longer than Demikhov's longest living two-headed dog, which survived 29 days. Even setting aside the deaths of the canine subjects, the moral implications of Demikhov's experiments are tricky. This head transplantation, unlike some of his other advancements in the field of transplantology, had no real life applications. Yet there were certainly very real implications for the dogs. So guys, my personal opinion here is that this should have been shut down from the first wind anyone got of it. The fact that it continued for as long as it did is honestly pretty sickening to me. Now we're just left with some of these creepy pictures of some experiments that really never should have happened. Number four on this list is the Salem UFO. This is one of the most famous photographs of a UFO to date and one that people keep coming back to as potential proof for alien life. The image was captured on August 3rd, 1952 and as you can see, shows four bright orbs in the sky. This was taken in Salem, Massachusetts at Salem's Coast Guard Air Station. Now there's been many potential explanations thrown around about what this could be, but the most prominent is definitely aliens. Some have speculated that it could be a reflection of light, some weird looking clouds, or just a product of a 1950s camera malfunctioning. Now these are all possible, but I'm gonna be honest, these are some pretty strange looking things in this picture. They look pretty much exactly how one would imagine a UFO to look. It also just so happens that around this time, tons of other UFO sightings were happening as well. This could have just been a coincidence, or it could be an actual sighting because they were just actually flying around back then. Comment down below what you guys think about this image. Was it a freak camera thing, or was it actually a UFO? Number three on this list is the Amityville Ghost Boy. The Amityville Horror House is one of the scariest real life ghost stories in human history. It all started when this home was host to a gruesome tragedy. Ronald Defoe Jr. shot and killed six members of his family in this house in 1974. Those who were killed never really left though and haunted the next people who lived in this home. The hauntings got so bad that our favorite real life Ghostbusters came in to save the day, Ed and Lorraine Warren. This case has most likely gone down as their most famous in their time as being active paranormal specialists. Now the photo in question is of a young boy with bright white eyeballs. History vs. Hollywood writes, The photo below was allegedly taken inside the Amityville house in 1976. It's become one of the most famous paranormal photos of all time. It features what appears to be a young boy with white eyes who's peeking out of a doorway. George Lutz revealed the Amityville ghost boy photo on the Merv Griffin show back in 1979, three years after it was taken. The image was supposedly captured by Gene Campbell, a professional photographer who was part of the team who worked worked with paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren. Gene had set up an automatic camera that took infrared pictures to capture the second floor landing during the night. Equipped with black and white film, his camera captured this Amityville ghost boy photo that some have speculated could be the ghost of the murdered child. John Defoe, who'd lived in this house with his family prior to the Lutzes. How a child would have gotten into this home, what he would have been doing here, these are all the questions that we don't know and probably won't ever know. That's why for now anyways, the most probable explanation is that of a ghost. Number two on this list is the Dietlov Pass. The Dietlov Pass incident is a tragic event that occurred in 1959. Nine Russian hikers died on February 1st and February 2nd in some very strange, unexplained circumstances. Listen to what Wikipedia writes about the manner to which these bodies were found. After the group's bodies were discovered, an investigation by Soviet authorities determined that six had died from hypothermia, while the other three had been killed by physical trauma. One victim had major skull damage, two had severe chest trauma, and another had a small crack in the skull. Four of the bodies were found lying in running water in a creek, and three of these had soft tissue damage of the head and face, two of the bodies were missing their eyes, one was missing its tongue, and one was missing its eyebrows. The investigation concluded that a compelling natural force had caused the deaths. Numerous theories have been put forward to account for the unexplained deaths, including animal attacks, hypothermia, 
avalanche, catabatic winds, infrasound induced panic, military involvement, or some combination of these. These are all plausible, but some other supernatural causes have also been thrown out there as well. Aliens, yetis, demons, these are all the things that people have speculated upon. The manner to which these people died is just so strange that it doesn't make sense. They were fine and then all of a sudden ran from the safety of their tents not dressed for the elements. The picture that we have here is from just prior to this event taking place and it's the last known image captured of these men alive. It's incredibly creepy because it looks as if they're walking into a snowy nothing. What was waiting for them in that nothing? That's anyone's guess. Number one on this list is the Brown Lady of Rainman Hall. This image was captured in the fall of 1936 while people were taking pictures of the house. The famous photo is of the central staircase and shows an image that looks strikingly like the ghost who resides here. The Brown Lady of Rainman Hall. This ghost is believed to be the spirit of Lady Dorothy Walpole who used to live in this home many, many years ago. She died over 200 years ago under suspicious circumstances and as as the years passed, more people started seeing her ghost appear around the residence. These rumors obviously exploded though after this photo was caught, showing the world that this poltergeist could potentially be real. The reason that I think this photo is the closest thing we have to real evidence of a ghost is because there were literal stories already surrounding a ghost at this location. It's one thing to take a photo and see something weird on it and then think, oh, maybe that's a ghost, but it's a complete other thing when there's already been rumors circulating about this ghost for centuries. Everything adds up. It makes sense why there'd be a poltergeist standing in the staircase and we even know who it is. Yes, 1930s cameras are shoddy to say the least, but when there's this much lore surrounding it, I tend to think that we may have gotten lucky and gotten an actual gem of a photograph proving the existence of a ghost. And if that's the case, then it isn't an exaggeration to say that this could be the most haunted photograph Ever. Number 5. The Pyramids and the Sphinx Famed for giving out riddles to passers-by and would-be kings and keeping even more secrets for itself, the Sphinx and the Great Pyramids of Giza aren't just one of the best tourist destinations in the world, they're a source of never-ending speculation. Were they crafted by aliens? Are there hidden secrets lying within the Sphinx that we don't know about? Almost certainly. Let's dissect them a bit. So the Sphinx. If you haven't heard of it, this is your first time hearing about it. It's one of the seven wonders of the world or something, but this might be the first time. It's a massive limestone statue with a lion's body and let's be real, it's a nice one at that and the head of a human. Was it always a human's face? There's some speculation and discussion about that. Some researchers have proposed that originally the Sphinx was a monument to the jackal god Anubis and that his face was refitted at some point in the image of Anamet II, a pharaoh from around that era. Now the purpose and origin remains a point of contention to Egyptologists. What was the Sphinx built for? Is it a tomb? A monument? Just something to take photos of? Some people even speculated that the Sphinx is older than Egypt even. A tomb? A monument? Just something to do? Researchers too have speculated that perhaps the Sphinx is older than Egypt even. Erosion pattern on the Sphinx's body appear consistent with water erosion rather than wind erosion, raising all sorts of questions about the climate and geological history. Did Egypt used to be like a lot wetter? And that's just what puzzles people on the outside. The inside of the thing is a whole other can of worms. Some propose that there are unexplored passages or secret chambers containing wondrous treasures, ancient texts, sacred artifacts. I think the Master Sword might even be in there. Some people think there's proof of extraterrestrial life. It's a very widespread conspiracy theory that aliens were involved in the Sphinx and the pyramids and are very closely tied to ancient Egyptian culture. Some limited excavations around the Sphinx have been carried out, but because of the delicate nature of the monument, further digging is a bit uh, challenging. You don't want to be the guy who ruined one of the seven wonders of the world. They're going to make fun of you forever if that happens. We could do a whole video on the mysteries behind the Sphinx, and I sincerely hope we do because we are just scratching the surface of strange stuff going on there. But if you're looking for way more strange stuff, then you already know we have that in spades. We've got just about everything freaky you can think of. We've done a video or two on it. So hit subscribe. Please hit that little bell as well so you make sure to get our videos up to date. Don't miss a single screen, but do that at the end of this video because I got four more unsolved mysteries for you coming up right now. Number four, the Voynich Manuscript. The manuscript is one of my personal favorite unsolved mysteries out there just for how sheer little we know about it. We have nothing. It's kind of a choose your own adventure for mysteries. Is it aliens? 
demons, a really convoluted historical prank. If you don't know, the Voynich Manuscript is a strange document written in a handwritten text filled with bizarre illustrations. No one's been able to make sense of it, primarily because it's written in a language that has never been seen elsewhere in human history. It was named after Wilfred Voynich, the Polish antiquarian who purchased it in 1912, although its ownership has passed through many hands. So what was it written for, and by who? These are the questions we've been asking, and we're probably going to keep asking over and over. The manuscript is about 240 pages, containing illustrations of plants, astronomical diagrams, humanoid figures, and other strange objects. Despite countless attempts by cryptographers, no one's been able to crack the code just yet. Some speculation has been made that it could be a biology textbook in an encoded language. Some people think it could be the scrawlings of a brilliant alchemist, magic and spell casting we couldn't possibly hope to understand. Some say it's from a forgotten civilization, while others have said maybe it's all just a load of nonsense and it's just made by someone who had too much time on their hands and a vengeance against historians who wanted to prank them for centuries. The book is thought to have come from anywhere between the 15th century and the 17th century. We don't even know when this thing was written. Like I said, we know next to nothing about it. Now, if you're feeling clever and inspired, you can find a PDF of the Voynich manuscript as a free download pretty easily. Who knows? You might be the one to finally crack this case. But hey, don't be frustrated if you end up falling down a conspiracy rabbit hole many before you have tried. I looked through a few of these pages and it took me 30 seconds before I was looking like Charlie from Always Sunny at the conspiracy wall, all that red tape and stuff. Number three, the Yonaguni Monument. You've heard of the lost city of Atlantis. Surely, of course you have. It's one of the best Disney movies you forgot about. That's a story for a whole other video. Well, what if it wasn't the only lost underwater city out there? Have you ever heard of the Yonaguni Monument? The Yonaguni Monument has sometimes been called Japan's Atlantis, and it refers to a strange, eerie underwater rock formation just off the coast of Yonaguni Island in Japan that has had people scratching their heads for years. It's a massive structure consisting of several flat rock slabs arranged in a way that seems like an intelligent life put it together. Now, some people say that this structure could be completely natural, resulting from years of erosion and tectonic activity. Certainly, stranger things have happened, and it wouldn't be completely impossible for something to form this way. But the way it exists now, the way it sits, it seems deliberately carved out. And it seems like it was an important structure to someone. Perhaps a monument, a temple, some sign of a lost city, hence the Atlantis comparisons. Is it possible this was evidence of a lost civilization buried beneath the ocean waves, forever forgotten to history? The monument being completely submerged has been fuel for the fire of speculation. Was it always underwater? Did it end up there over time? Did the water raise around it? Did the land used to look significantly different? It makes it pretty difficult to study as well, making it just that little bit more elusive, as if it wasn't mysterious enough as is. But let's be real, it was probably aliens. It was almost certainly aliens. Number two, the Bermuda Triangle. Ah, the Bermuda Triangle. Now there's an exquisite ancient mystery. One of the certified classics. Something that's eluded us for years and will probably continue to do so. It's been referred to before as the Devil's Triangle, and it's host to all manner of mysterious incidents and unexplained phenomena. One of the more infamous incidents linked to the Bermuda Triangle is the disappearance of Flight 19 in December 1945. Five Navy bombers vanished during a routine training mission alongside 14 crew members. Gone. Zilch. There was an extensive search effort, but nothing was ever found. Not so much as a bolt off the hull, a boot fished up, a hat, nothing. It was as if they were swallowed up by the void. Naturally, people went a bit wild with theories on this one. Anything from aliens, electromagnetic anomalies, alternate realities, no clipping into the back room. You know, pretty serious academic stuff. But it's bizarre. Another particularly good Bermuda baffler for you is the case of the USS Cyclop. In March 1918, the 542 foot long cargo ship carrying over 300 crew members vanished during its voyage from Barbados. No wreckage, no survivors ever found. Certainly you would think a ship that big with that many people would leave behind a little bit of evidence, right? What happened? Were they swallowed up by the very seas themselves, pulled to Davy Jones's locker by the Kraken? Or are they somewhere we can't reach them, in a place between worlds and time? The region is known for all sorts of weird stuff too, involving electronic malfunctions and compass deviations. It makes it seem like there is just something 
bad in the air out there? Maybe just bad vibes? Certainly seems that way. At number one, the Dorset Mass Grave. Oh, this one is a doozy, and it is one of the scariest and most confusing archaeological discoveries ever found. Let me ask you, what's more fun than a barrel of monkeys? A barrel of Vikings? Well, how about a mass grave full of headless Viking bodies? No? Well, you and I find different things fun, I suppose. Way back in the yesteryear of 2008, a group of archaeologists were on a fairly routine digging operation in Dorset, a quaint little seaside town in England. They were supervising a digging operation to improve local roads and were on set to see if there was anything of note to find, you know, if they came across an old coin or an old arrowhead or something you can stuff in a museum case. For the first few days of the job, there wasn't anything particularly noteworthy discovered until they came across the mass pile of 54 entangled Viking corpses all missing their heads. I guess they thought that was probably kind of interesting. If it was just a, you know, a bunch of headless Viking bodies, that'd be one thing. But the mass grave was wrapped in confusing details. Their skulls were missing, but as well their rib cages, arms, and leg bones were all scattered around, this is disgusting, surrounded by discarded teeth. No clothes or weaponry was recovered. So what in the Allfather's name happened here? Because absolutely nothing I can imagine is pleasant. Sounds like Vikings opened up a portal to hell, went really wild with it. The teeth found around the grave had all been filed down neatly, which is very interesting. Now, it goes without saying that Viking dental surgery could not have been painless, meaning the process had to be excruciating, suggesting it was either done by a very careful tormentor or done to themselves to intimidate their opponents to show just how gritty they are. I actually don't know which of those two are preferable. They actually both sound pretty horrible. Now, as good as my theory about a bunch of Vikings opening up a portal to hell and being offered as a sacrifice is, archaeology had some different ideas. They theorized that by looking at the wound patterns on the ribs and torso, they were surgical precise blows, which wasn't really the kind of thing you'd expect from a rabid Viking warrior flailing around a sword in a brawl. The archaeologists thought that these men were either offered up as part of a horrifyingly sadistic ritual, or it was a big time mass sentencing where everybody was sentenced to the death. Explains too where all the weapons and gear had gone. These men had been brought here from somewhere else and then left here for a long, long, long time. We might never know the truth behind the Dorset mass grave, and I'm gonna be honest, that might be fine with me. Some secrets are better left buried. Anyone else feel though that all those Viking skeletons, that might be like the world's most terrifying puzzle to put all that together? Morbid thought, and that's something to end the video on. Starting off at number five, burning at the stake. By far the most well-known punishment for those tried as witches, burning at the stake was a cruel and unusual form of execution used commonly back during the many witch trials of the 17th century. These executions were not only physically agonizing, but also symbolized the depths of human fear and prejudice. One such example of this terrible practice was the Würzburg Witch Trials of the 17th century, known as one of the largest witch trials in history. Accused witches faced a horrifying fate at the stake. The authorities believed that fire possessed the purifying power to cleanse the accused of their alleged connections to the devil. In reality, it was a grotesque display of violence. Victims were often tied to wooden stakes in a public square surrounded by jeering crowds. They were subjected to unimaginable pain as the flames slowly consumed them. The agony of being burnt alive was drawn out, excruciating, and inhumane. What made the burning of witches particularly cruel was the complete absence of credible evidence. The trials were fueled by paranoia, superstition, and hysteria. Accusations were often based on flimsy hearsay, personal grudges, or even just random suspicions. The accused had little chance to defend themselves, and confessions were often extracted through rigorous mental and physical torment. These false confessions only added to the tragedy, as innocent people were forced to implicate themselves and others in a desperate attempt to end their suffering. Furthermore, the persecution of witches during the Würzburg witch trials, like many other witch hunts, was often intertwined with gender bias. Women, especially those who didn't conform to societal norms, were disproportionately targeted. Accusations of witchcraft could be used to control and punish women who challenged the status quo or 
poor were perceived as a threat to male authority. The cruelty of burning witches at the stake was not limited to the physical torment. It was a gruesome spectacle, intended to terrify the populace into submission. Public executions were meant to send a message that dissent would not be tolerated and that conformity to prevailing religious and social norms was imperative. The psychological impact on society was profound, as fear and mistrust tore communities apart. The Wurzburg witch trials, like many others, were eventually recognized as a dark chapter in history. They serve as a stark reminder of the dangers of mass hysteria, religious fantasism, and the absence of due process. Today we look back on these events with horror and regret, vowing never to repeat the cruelty of burning alleged witches at the stake. It is a somber lesson that underscores the importance of justice, reason, and compassion in our pursuit of a more enlightened society. Next up at number 4. Witch cakes. Witch cakes are a bizarre and unsettling aspect of the witch trials that swept through colonial America during the 17th century, as exemplified in the infamous case of Tichuba. These cakes, concocted from peculiar ingredients, were believed to possess the power to reveal the presence of witches. While they may seem like a bizarre footnote in history, witch cakes serve as a chilling reminder of the hysteria and irrationality that fueled the witch trials. In the case of Tichuba, a slave woman living in Salem, Massachusetts, witch cakes played a central role in her ordeal. Tichuba was accused of practicing witchcraft, and her accuser sought a means to expose her supposed demonic affiliations. They decided to bake a witch cake, a crude mixture of rye meal and the urine of the afflicted girls who claimed to be victims of witchcraft. Ew. The logic behind these cakes was deeply flawed and rooted in superstition. It was believed that by feeding the cake to a dog, the dog would act as a conduit, causing the witch to experience pain and reveal their true nature. This bizarre form of witch detection demonstrates the length of which fear and paranoia can drive people to concoct irrational and cruel methods of persecution. Tichuba was subjected to this ordeal, and when the dog exhibited unusual behavior, you know, because it was eating urine, it was seen as evidence of her guilt. This marked the beginning of her traumatic journey through the Salem witch trials, which ultimately led to her confession under duress. The use of witch cakes underscores the hysteria and desperation that characterized the witch trials. Accusers and authorities were willing to resort to absurd and unscientific methods to justify their persecution of those they believed to be witches. These methods were not only illogical, but also cruel, as they subjected the accused to public humiliation, physical examinations, and often torment. Number 3. Dunking Dunking was a cruel and unusual punishment employed during the witch trials that swept through Europe and its colonies in the 16th and 17th centuries, including Northamptonshire, England. This brutal practice, also known as ducking or swimming, was intended to determine an individual's guilt or innocence of witchcraft, but it often resulted in severe physical and psychological suffering. In Northamptonshire and other regions, dunking involved binding the accused witch, often a woman, and lowering her into a body of water, typically a river or pond. The rationale behind this test was rooted in superstition and flawed logic. It was believed that because witches had renounced their baptism, the pure element of water would reject them causing them to float. If the accused floated, they were seen as guilty of witchcraft. If they sank, they were deemed innocent, but often drowned in the process. Being forcibly dunked into cold water while bound was a terrifying and painful experience. The accused would struggle for air and face the risk of drowning, all while the onlookers watched in morbid anticipation. Dunking was an arbitrary and irrational method of determining guilt. The outcome depended on various factors, such as the accused body's composition and the skill of the dunking implement. Implementers. Innocent people could easily be declared guilty, leading to wrongful executions. Despite its cruelty and lack of reliability, dunking persisted in witch trials because it was consistent with the prevailing belief in the supernatural and the desire for swift justice. It was only with the eventual decline of witch hunts and the advent of more rational legal systems that such inhumane practices were abandoned. At number 2, Prayer Tests. Prayer tests stand as the greatest example of the unjust nature of the witch trials and the persecution of innocent individuals, making it a cruel punishment for anyone put on trial. They were a controversial and often absurd method used during the witch trials to supposedly rule out witches. These tests were grounded in superstition and religious fervor rather than sound evidence. Two notable cases, those of Jane Wenham and George Burroughs, shed light on the use and cruel consequences of such prayer tests during witch trials. Jane 
Jane Wenham's case is one of the last witch trials in England, occurring in 1712. She was accused of witchcraft in Hertfordshire, and her trial attracted considerable attention due to the changing climate of skepticism regarding witch trials. One of the methods employed to test her guilt or innocence was the prayer test. In Wenham's trial, the prayer test involved having the accused recite the Lord's Prayer without error usually out of the Bible or other holy texts. It was believed that a witch would be unable to utter the prayer correctly due to their alleged unholy nature. However, this test was deeply flawed and arbitrary, as it ignored the fact that many accused witches were uneducated and might struggle with reading the Lord's Prayer, especially in the intense and stressful environment of a trial. She also underwent dunking in order to test her witchy nature. Fortunately, Jane Wenham was found not guilty, thanks to the rising skepticism surrounding witchcraft. Even when accused of flying, the judge would retort, is flying a crime? Which it isn't. Her case is often cited as a turning point in England's witch trials, as it exposed the irrationality and injustice of such proceedings. But in the case of George Burroughs in 1692, he wasn't so lucky. George Burroughs was one of the individuals accused and executed during the Salem witch trials in colonial Massachusetts. His case highlights how the prayer test was used in the American context. In Burroughs' trial, the authorities used the Lord's Prayer as a test of his innocence. They believed that if he couldn't recite it correctly, he must be a witch. Burroughs, to the astonishment of many, recited the prayer flawlessly, challenging the validity of the test. However, the court, fueled by hysteria and prejudice, dismissed this as a trick of the devil. So much for testing him, right? George Burroughs was ultimately convicted and hanged, illustrating how even when an accused individual passed the prayer test, it did not it did not guarantee their acquittal or protection from the witch hunt's irrationality. So yeah, if you were wanted dead back then, you would be made dead. And at number one, crushing. In the annals of history, the Salem Witch Trials of 1692 stand as a stark testament to humanity's capacity for cruelty, particularly in the realm of legal punishment. Amid the hysteria that gripped colonial Massachusetts, a plethora of cruel and unusual methods were employed to elicit confessions from the accused witches. Among these harrowing practices, the use of pressing or crushing remains one of the most chilling. The process of pressing was as brutal as it was inhumane. The accused individual would be stripped of all dignity and laid down in a dark, dank cell. Heavy stones or wooden boards, laden with an unimaginable weight, would then be stacked upon their chest. The agony that followed was beyond words. As the relentless pressure bore down, every grasp for breath became a desperate struggle. The rationale behind this method was chillingly simplistic. Those who confessed to their alleged dealings with the devil could halt the pressing, while those who resisted would face an excruciating demise. The authorities, consumed by fear and paranoia, believed that witches, having supposedly consorted with Satan, possessed a supernatural resilience that rendered them impervious to such torment. The cruelty of pressing was evident not only in its physical brutality, but also in its stark absence of due process. Accused witches had no chance to defend themselves, no legal representation, and no recourse to justice. Their fates rested in the hands of accusers and a court swayed by mass hysteria and irrational beliefs. Perhaps the most infamous case of pressing during the Salem witch trials was that of Giles Corey. A resilient and principled man, Corey refused to enter a plea, knowing that doing so would lead to the forfeiture of his property. His stoic resistance, in the face of a slow and agonizing death, made him a symbol of defiance against the unjust trials. When it comes to the history books, there's more occult stuff than not. Finding notable and shocking tales for today was more a struggle of narrowing down instead of the usual struggle of finding. So I'm hoping y'all like it enough for a part two. Question for you, what's your favorite tale of the occult? Let me know in the comments and stay tuned until the end of today for another edition of Comment Section Shoutouts. Alrighty folks, I'm gonna kick this off with less of a mystery and more of a crime from the 90s in the name of the occult that hurt my brain. Yeah, it's probably more recent than expected, but bear with me here. Welcome to the dark and twisted world of the Beasts of Satan. A name that echoes not just a criminal group, but a haunting chapter in the tales of occult mysteries from history. See, I like a good rhyme. The sinister saga unfolds like a macabre symphony, blending elements of satanic rituals, heavy metal music, and gruesome killings in a chilling crescendo that gripped Italy from 1998 until 2004. It all began with the red-soaked canvas of a double homicide in the woods near Soma Lombardo, a locale that would later be stained with more tales of horror. 
Kiara Marino and Fabio Tolis, a young couple immersed in the metal subculture, were sacrificed in a substance-fueled occult rite, marking the inception of a series of satanic ritual killing. The perpetrators, including names like Andrea Volpe, Nicola Sapone, and Mario Maccione, were not merely acquaintances. They were friends who turned into agents of the malevolence. The initial investigation stumbled, attributing the disappearance of the couple to a love affair gone awry. However, Fabio Tolis' father, Michel Tolis, embarked on a personal quest to unravel the truth. His persistence revealed a nexus between Satanism, the occult, and the black and death metal genres that his son and friends were drawn to. The story takes a darker turn with the third killing in 2004, involving Mariangela Pizzotta, a former girlfriend of Andrea Volpe. The details are gruesome, and she was fired at, mutilated, and buried alive in a greenhouse. The crimes were not just about death, but a perverse dance with it, marked by addiction and substance-fueled madness. As the investigation progressed, the abyss widened, revealing potential connections to other unsolved cases. The alleged involvement of the beasts of Satan in up to 14 other mysterious deaths, including self-inflicted ones, disappearances, and violent incidents, cast a shadow of terror over the entire situation. The trials that followed saw convictions, but the reactions were kind of mixed. The sentence seemed inadequate to some, while others found solace in the semblance of justice. Life imprisonment awaited the leader, Nicolas Sapone, while others faced long terms behind bars. The aftermath of this dark chapter extended beyond prison walls. Concerns about Satanism's allure amongst Italian youth grew, prompting calls for bans on death metal music. The revelations led to the establishment of a specialized police unit focused on investigating new religious sects and ritualistic groups, signaling a societal response to the fear that gripped the nation. Okay, so this next situation is less so a mystery, but another historical occult crime that I can't go without mentioning today. If Aleister Crowley isn't the first person that pops into your brain when you think about occult wrongdoings in history, I'd like to know who is. Born in 1875, Aleister Crowley was one of the most notorious occultists in the modern era. He had a rebellious youth when he joined the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, where he was trained in ceremonial magic by Samuel Adele McGregor Mathers and Alan Bennett. He went mountaineering in Mexico with Oscar Eckenstein for studying Hindu and Buddhist practices practices in India. In 1904, he married Rose Edith Kelly and they honeymooned in Cairo, Egypt, where Crowley claimed to have been contacted by a supernatural entity named Iwas, who provided him with the Book of the Law, a sacred text that served as the basement for the Lama, a traveler who loved the mountains. Alistair sought the most extreme and obscure forms of magic. In 1900, he attempted the Abramelin ritual, which required six months to complete and allegedly gave him control over the 12 Lords of Hell. However, he abandoned the ritual before completing it, which I don't blame him. Six months is a long time. So he then founded his own religion, Thelema, identifying himself as the prophet entrusted with guiding humanity. After the unsuccessful 1905 Kachinjunga expedition and a visit to India and China, Alistair returned to Britain, where he attracted attention as a prolific author of poetry, novels, and occult literature. In 1907, he and George Cecil Jones co-founded an esoteric order, through which they propagated Thelema. After spending time in Algeria, in 1912, Alistair was initiated into another esoteric order, the German-based Ordo Templi Orientis, or OTO for short, rising to become the leader of its British branch, which he reformulated in accordance with his personal beliefs. Through the OTO, Thelemite groups were established in Britain, Australia, and North America. Alistair spent the First World War in the United States, where he took up painting and campaigned for the German war effort against Britain, later revealing that he had infiltrated the pro-German movement to assist the British intelligence services. In 1920, he established the Abbey of Delema, a religious commune in Cephalus, Sicily, where he lived with various followers. His libertine lifestyle led to denunciations in the British press, and the Italian government evicted him in 1923. He divided the following two decades between France, Germany, and England, and continued to promote his religion until his death. The Book of Necronomicon, dedicated to Alistair, mentions that necromantic magic has caused changes in the consciousness for, you know, those who were most intimately involved with it. Therefore, it undertakes the principle of facing all the fears and darkness that resides within to reach the light and spirit within the soul. Alistair believed sincerely in the existence of magic, to the point where he performed Enochian magic to make himself invisible. He's even stated that apparently once upon a time a vampire attacked him. Which, excuse me? I would like to know more about that. Alrighty, now to get into some fun mysteries. How about we start off with a werewolf? 
So The Werewolf of Bedburg, a tale that weaves through the fabric of the 17th century, is a chilling narrative that transcends the boundaries of mere folklore. At its core is Peter Stubby, a seemingly upstanding member of society, a wealthy farmer, a widower, and a father to two offspring. Yet beneath this facade lies a creature of the night, a werewolf with an insatiable appetite for humid redness and a penchant for unspeakable horrors. Peter's alleged crimes are not for the faint of heart. The laundry list of atrocities include taking schmexual advantage of people, hurting folks in the same vein, the gruesome act of ripping spawn from pregnant women, and the um, rope necklacing of small humans, and also the raw consumption of innocent lambs and calves. I apologize if any of that verbiage confused you. The interwebs don't like me talking about icky criminal acts, but if we're going to ignore history, then we're doomed to repeat it. So I'm doing the best I can here. If you have questions, I'm sure somebody in the comments can help you out. The depths of his depravity reached their peak with the horrific mass killing of his own family, a monstrous act that involved impregnating his daughter, killing his son, and then devouring the young one's brains. Sheesh. The community that once held him in high regard as a two-faced, empathetic widower now recoiled in horror as the true nature of Peter was unveiled. The werewolf of Bedburg was not just a mythical creature in the shadows, it was a very real madness that had infiltrated the fabric of daily life. The climax of this tale, as with many stories of its kind, is the capture and execution of the monstrous perpetrator. Peter met his end, and the echoes of his gruesome deeds reverberated through, you know, history books. This harrowing narrative has persisted over centuries, retold and adapted, capturing the collective imagination of, well, everybody. This werewolf stands not only as a tale of horror, but as a reminder that things are kind of scary out there, we don't know everything, and that's my nightmare fuel right there. Ready to hang out in the 1600s for a minute? Me too! Let's go back in time together. The Drummer of Tedworth, a tale hailing from the depths of the 1600s, unfolds like a spectral melody resonating through the corridors of Wiltshire's haunted history. Picture this, a mysterious drummer, unseen but omnipresent, wandering through the streets of Tedworth, drumming not just a rhythmic beat, but an unsettling demand for money. Sounds like every freak show I've been at ever. In the midst of this spectral drumming, a man named John Mompesson, perturbed by the relentless rhythms, decides to take matters into his own hand. He has the drummer apprehended, his drum confiscated, until he confesses to the alleged fraud of his actions. The paranormal percussionist, once detained, vanishes from the scene upon his release, leaving behind an eerie quiet that precedes an even stranger turn of events. As Mompesson embarks on a journey to London, a trip meant to provide respite, his family becomes the unwilling audience to a haunting encore. The air is pierced by the unmistakable sounds of drumming, loud and relentless, echoing through the walls of their home. The drummer, once a tangible figure, transforms into an ethereal presence, playing his spectral beats in the dead of night. First recorded in a pamphlet in 1678, the story of the drummer of Tedworth has endured the test of time, weaving its way into the fabric of occult discussions. Whether regarded as a piece of historical mystery or dismissed as a mere legend, the tale of the haunted drum and its ghostly percussionist persists, a mysterious echo from a bygone era that refuses to be silenced. See, I promised y'all actual mysteries today. Alrighty, we're gonna end this entire list with a tale from biblical times. So how was that for a history lesson? The Witch of Endor, a mysterious figure embedded in the ancient tapestry of the Hebrew Bible, emerges in the book of 1 Samuel 28, a chapter that plunges us into the realm of the supernatural. So, picture this. King Saul, facing imminent battle and devoid of his trusted seer Samuel, turns to this mystical practitioner for guidance, a desperate grasp of the threads connecting the living and the dead. Saul's quest for insight, his yearning for a conduit to the spirit world, leads him to the Witch of Endor. It's a moment steeped in desperation, a king seeking answers beyond the veil of the tangible. The encounter unfolds, and the revelation is chilling. A proclamation of Saul's impending defeat, a destiny sealed in the threads of the spiritual fabric. This occult liaison catapults the Witch of Endor into the realms of necromancy and spiritualism. In the intricate mosaic of various occult practices and modern paganism, she becomes a symbol, a psychic medium representing the land surrounding Israel. The questions that arise from her tale delve into the moral quandaries of her actions, probing the delicate threads that bind the living to the ethereal. The Witch of Endor's story, a kaleidoscope of interpretation, weaves its way through the chapters of history, each retelling adding nuances to the intricate dance between the realms. It's more than a narrative. It's a philosophical exploration of the intersection between the living and the dead, a contemplation of the morality embedded in the pursuit of supernatural knowledge. As we unravel the layers of her tale, we confront the enduring power of occult witchcraft and the intricacies of the spiritual realm. The Witch of Endor, a spectral figure from the ancient past, beckons us to contemplate the unseen forces that shape our world, leaving us with more questions than answers, a perpetual mystery echoing through the corridors of time. Number five on this list is the Bassano Vase. The Bassano vase is one of those old family heirlooms that you really don't want to get passed down to you. It started out as a wedding gift, also something that you really don't want to receive on your wedding day. Anyways, it's a pretty vase, so the couple accepted this vase and then tragedy struck. On the night of the wedding, after the ceremony, the bride was found dead in her room. 
It said that she had her hands wrapped around this vase as she was dying and in her final breaths before passing, vowed to have her revenge. This little vow at the end muddles things because we're not sure whether it was the vow that cursed the vase or if the vase was already cursed, but whatever. Adding it to the story makes it a little bit more interesting, so she cursed the vase. Either way, at this point, nobody realized that the vase had anything to do with the death of the young bride, which is really too bad. The vase turned into a family heirloom and was passed from generation to generation. As you can imagine, it didn't go so great for those who received this. More people kept dying, all of them extremely mysteriously. Eventually, somebody caught on and decided that this vase needed to get locked up for good. For a time, it was locked up in a secret location and nobody knew where this vase was. It should have stayed that way, though. The vase in 1988 saw the light of day again and was sold off to a wealthy bidder who basically just bought an extremely expensive way to die. He died very soon after receiving this vase and thus it began all over again. The vase exchanged hands some more, killing off more and more people as it went. Finally, somebody with some proactive thinking gave it to the police. Now, nobody knows where it ended up. Whether the police destroyed it, hit it, or held onto it is anyone's guess. Number four on this list is the Chained Oak. This one is really interesting, and even though history hasn't necessarily hidden it from us, it's definitely tried to negate the consequences. Atlas Obscura says, The Chained Oak is an old tree wrapped in chains to prevent its branches from falling. This is due to an alleged curse put on the tree when, in 1821, the 15th Earl of Shrewsbury refused a woman's pleas for money. It's said that she then put a curse upon the nearby oak. For every branch that falls from the tree, a member of the Earl's family would die. Later that night, one of the Earl's relatives died suddenly under mysterious circumstances. Convinced that the curse was true, the Earl ordered that the branches of the oak should be chained up to prevent more from falling. I feel for that Earl's family, man. Like, literally, I'm just a grandkid of this dude, and now if this tree breaks a little bit, I'm gonna die? No thank you. At least the Earl had the sense to chain up the tree and make sure that it won't happen to harm his family. But one big storm rolls through that place and wham, now some random person is just dying. Just pray that you don't happen to be the descendant of this guy, and if you are, cross your fingers those chains were done up tight. Number three on this list is the baker's wedding dress. Marriage is supposed to be one of the happiest times of your life. Finding that partner you intend to spend the rest of your life with and then actually doing just that. Therefore, one of the happiest days of your life should be the day that all of this becomes official, your wedding day. That's why it's particularly sad when tragedy or drama occurs on the day of said wedding. Just that is exactly what happened with Anna Baker. Scoop Whoop says, Inside the Baker Mansion in Altoona, USA is the wedding dress of Anna Baker, who fell in love with an iron worker. Legends claim that Anna eloped from her home to get married to her lover, but her father forcibly brought her back and locked her in her bedroom. She then refused to marry anyone else and spent the rest of her life alone. After her death, the members of the Baker family reported spotting Anna's wedding dress at different places around the house. Some of them even saw the spirit of Anna Baker moving around the house dressed in that same wedding dress. Imagine literally getting forced back home and locked in your room by your father as you're getting married. It's no wonder that Anna was pissed and why this specific object has become very cursed. Now it's locked up in a case and hidden from the world in the Baker Mansion. It's a good thing that it is because what Scoop Whoop didn't talk about is the fact that this dress can actually be dangerous. As ridiculous as it actually sounds, it has reportedly tried to strangle people in their sleep before. I know that the image of a floating wedding dress trying to suffocate somebody is kind of humorous, but I promise you that you wouldn't be laughing if it happened to you. I like that this thing is locked up, but would be far more comfortable if we just threw it in the fire and were done with it completely. Number two on this list is the Anguished Man Painting. The Anguished Man Painting is pretty much exactly what it sounds like, a painting of a man in some very clear anguish. The thing is that this man doesn't really look all that human. He hardly has any facial features at all and almost looks a bit like a burn victim. Also, where his eyeballs should be, there's just these two gaping holes and his mouth also looks like one giant hole with no end. Even without the haunting associated with this picture, it's already pretty scary and I personally have no idea why anyone would want it in their home. That's exactly what Sean Robinson did though and he quickly suffered the consequences. 
Scoop Whoop says, Fascinated by the charm of the anguished man painting, Sean Robinson inherited the painting from his grandmother and decided to hang the painting on the wall of his house. Soon after that, Sean and his family started experiencing paranormal events like cracking of the doors in the middle of the night and sudden blood-curdling screams from nowhere. Sean's wife decided to investigate the origin of the painting and found that the artist who painted the painting killed himself and before doing that, he mixed his own blood with the paint that he used in making the painting. Learning this, the couple decided to hide the painting in the basement of their house in Cumbria. So, the first thing about this story that is kind of questionable is how anybody could be fascinated by the charm of this thing. It's gross, and I don't like looking at it, let alone having it hanging in my home. The second thing that's super questionable is why we decided to hide it. I swear, none of these people have ever heard of fire before, guys. Like, great, thank you for hiding it from the world, this is helpful, but what would be even more helpful is if we just took a match and burned it so nobody ever has to deal with it again. I apologize to the artist who painted this thing, but if you're gonna use your own blood and make a haunted painting, then come on, man, kinda deserves to be burned. And finally, number one on this list is the Thomas Busby Chair. This chair is freaking deadly, man, and even though it's pretty much safe from public use now, I still hate that it exists. Scoop Whoop says, popularly known as Busby's stoop chair, this wooden furniture is cursed by the spirit of Thomas Busby, who was known to ruthlessly murder people. Before getting hanged for his crimes, he requested to have a meal in his favorite local pub. Upon finishing his meal, he stood and said, may sudden death come to anyone who dares sit on my chair. And ever since then, 63 people who dared to sit on the chair met untimely and terrifying deaths. Later, the owner of the pub donated the chair to the Thirsk Museum UK, and it's still there, hung one and a half meters off the ground to prevent any further deaths. Can you imagine owning that pub and being like, Oh, no worries, 60 people have died in this chair, all is good. Like, how the heck did we allow 63 separate people to sit in this chair and die? And okay, like, I'm happy that it's hanging one and a half meters off the ground and nobody can sit in it, but guys, come on. This is literally a dangerous weapon that we have right here. The fact that this thing hasn't been totally dismantled is kind of ridiculous. What happens if somebody steals this chair and then decides, you know what, I'm gonna murder people with it without anybody finding out? Frankly, I think history should have hidden this thing a little bit better. Hopefully we don't hear any more murderous stories about it from here on out. The Birdcage Theatre. And if you're particularly interested in the breakneck history of the Wild West, then this place may already sound a little familiar to you. Tombstone, Arizona, the last boomtown of the American frontier. It's an important place enough, and it appears that all of the bloodthirsty moments of violence and murderous revenge all seem to happen in one location. The Bird Cage Theatre originally opened on December 26th, 1881 by owners Lottie and Billy Hutchinson with the intention of being a respectable variety show theatre for the equally respectable inhabitants of Tombstone, Arizona. If you know anything about the history of Tombstone though, respectable didn't exactly meet their aspirations and Billy and Lottie quickly began to cater for a different kind of crowd entirely. It is said that between 1881 and 1889, 26 murders were documented as taking place at the birdcage, mainly for its reputation as being a melting pot meeting point for every criminal and gunslinger in the Wild West. In fact, the longest poker game in history was played in the basement of the birdcage theatre, which still holds the record to this day. Anyone who entered the table had to pay $1,000 up front, which was a small fortune back in the day, and notable players included Bat Masterson, Diamond Jim Brady, Adolphus Bush, Doc Holliday, and the legendary Wyatt Earp. The poker game itself ran for the entire duration that the Birdcage Theatre was open, operating 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, for a total of 8 years. It is believed that over 10 million US dollars were exchanged in the game for its duration, which is insane when you think about it. Regardless though, with as much intrigue and cold hard cash pouring into the place, people obviously clamoured for a slice of that pie, and the Birdcage was the site of countless bloodthirsty altercations, and still to this day, the souls of many unfortunate frontiersmen and women are said to roam its ruins. Also, if if you haven't seen Tombstone starring Val Kilmer and Kurt Russell, stop what you're doing right now and go and watch it. Coming in at number four, the horse you came in on, which 
Come on is an awesome name for a bar, right? Sadly for us though, its original name was far less mysterious. But it's also the second place of intrigue on our list that just so happens to serve booze. And for this particular establishment, there is one infamous ghostly figure that may be inexplicably tied to its history. Quoth the raven nevermore, our man Edgar Allan Poe. Built in 1795 in Baltimore, Maryland, and founded as a saloon under a completely different name, the bar was built next to the docks and served as a drinking hole for the sailors, shipbuilders, and other such miscreants that populated 18th century Baltimore. Obviously this combination was a winning one and the saloon soon garnered the attention of a much more haunted kind of clientele, none other than Edgar Allan Poe. You see, as the legend tells it, this bar was the last bar that Poe would pass on his way home. And you know, given the kind of musings that he was frequent to, it often required a few liquid libations to spur on the inspiration of some of the finest works of gothic horror literature ever written. In fact, Poe became such a frequent visitor to the saloon that it is widely considered to be the last place that he was seen before his mysterious death in 1849. As the legend goes, the saloon was the last place he drank before being found on the night of October 3rd, 1849, deliriously wandering the streets of Baltimore, rambling about horrors unseen. He died four days later, the cause of his death is still a mystery to this day. And some say that after leaving the bar, he was found wearing clothes that weren't his own, repeatedly calling out the name Reynolds. Some sources say that Poe's last word words were, Lord help my poor soul, but all medical records have since been lost, including his death certificate. Whatever the truth is, it is said that the bartenders often leave out a glass of cognac after last call at the horse you came in on, the drink of choice for Poe. And as they say it, every morning, they find the glass empty. Next up at number three, the legend of the death tree. For all intents and purposes, Villa, Missouri is very much a ghost town. First built in 1868, the town itself has been the site of some particularly strange moments throughout history. But now with a population of just 125, the place has been in decline ever since the late 70s. Despite that though, it's particularly dark past has managed to cling on to one of its most fearsome legends. That of the death tree and the malevolent spirit of rotten Johnny Reb. You see, due to its positioning as a border state, like most places in Missouri, the town of Avila found itself split during the Civil War, with both halves falling on either side of the conflict. Because of that, Avila was the site of some rather grisly encounters, and as the legend goes, during the war, the skull of a Confederate bushwhacker was found out in the woods that bordered the town, the grim remains of one particularly bloody battle. However, instead of burying the skull, the locals hung it from a tree as a warning sign to other bushwhackers to stay put in the wilderness and not spill out their conflict toward their town. Well obviously, this action had the complete opposite effect and the legend of Rotten Johnny Reb was born. Ever since his skull was hung on the death tree, his spirit roamed the town, searching for unionists to murder in revenge for mocking him. Over the years, many deaths were contributed to the existence of Rotten Johnny Reb, and as his supernatural power grew, the vast majority of the remaining townspeople quickly fled a villa, terrified by the tales of the phantom bushwhacker. According to the old legend, the only way to ultimately end the curse and finally put Rotten Johnny's spirit to rest is to find his skull out in the wild, cut it down from the tree, and bury it in holy ground. However, those that knew where the death tree resided have long since passed, and so the true knowledge of its location has faded from memory. As the locals tell it, there was once a belief that black crows would flock to the death tree during the day and perch upon its twisted branches. Some say that it was an apple tree that no longer bears fruit, and if you ever find an apple out in the woods, you'll find another nearby, leading you to his ghostly realm. Swinging in at number two, the Axeman of New Orleans. And really, we can't talk about creepy North American history without addressing one of its most bloodthirsty mysteries, the Axeman of New Orleans, a murderous killing spree that reigned from May 1918 to October 1919, taking the lives of six innocent people and grievously injuring six more. And that may also have started much earlier in 1911, but that's anyone's guess. You see, despite the very public panic and revelation of his crimes, the Axeman was never identified, and the murders remain unsolved to this very day, and more than likely, they will never be solved. As the name suggests, the Axeman's modus operandi was to murder with an axe, which strangely enough, toying with the Louisiana police during his campaign of terror. The vast majority of the Axeman's victims were Italian immigrants or Italian Americans, leading many to believe that his crimes were ethnically 
motivated. Whilst many media outlets sensationalised many aspects of his crimes, given the fact that there was next to nothing to go on, the leading theory was that the Axeman was operating on behalf of the Mafia, despite lack of any evidence whatsoever. The strangest instance of the Axeman came on March 13th, 1919, where a letter to local newspapers was sent by the Axeman stating that he would kill again at 15 minutes past midnight, but would instead spare any homeowners that were playing jazz music. That very night, every single dance hall in New Orleans was filled to capacity, and bands of all calibers played jazz at hundreds of houses and private parties across the city. There were no murders that night, and that was the last correspondence of the Axeman of New Orleans. His bloodthirsty mystery forever unsolved. And finally, coming in at number one spot, the Brown Mountain Lights. Which is an intriguing name nonetheless, but the truth of the matter remains, there is perhaps no other such source of North American mystery than the Brown Mountain Lights, a potentially paranormal phenomena with so many differing explanations that it's anyone's guess where on earth this legend first started. The lights themselves are a series of ghost lights that emerge near Brown Mountain in North Carolina that reportedly on any clear evening can be seen for miles across the mountain overlook. Now, although there are countless instances of strange lights that emerge all across North America, the brown mountain lights seem to stand out as the most consistently sourced and verified. The earliest verified accounts date all the way back to September 24th, 1913, where a fisherman reported to the Charlotte Daily Observer that he had seen mysterious lights just above the horizon every single night. First dismissed as a trick of the horizon, the site became the study of the US Geological Survey who gave credit to the witnesses claims in 1922 by dismissing the possibility that the lights were in fact passing trains following the events of a flood that destroyed the electrical grid and the lights continued to appear during the study. Throughout history there have been countless potential origins of the Brown Mountain Lights, many of which are wrapped up in tragic tales of lost lovers or wandering woodsmen. However, the oldest and perhaps most profound explanation dates all the way back to the year 1200, where the legend goes that the Cherokee and Catawba nations engaged in a vicious battle upon the ridge of what is now known as Brown Mountain. There, so much blood was shed by either side that even the bodies of their most mighty warriors were lost beneath the soil. That night after the fight had ended and the blood spilt, the women of both tribes lit torches and they scoured the ridge for the bodies of their fallen loved ones. It is said that night after night they would light their torches again in search of their lovers' bodies never to be found. Local legend says that this mournful scene was so tragic and intense that it is forever imprinted into the historical fabric of the mountain, haunting it. Number 5 on this list is the Catholic persecution in Britain. This happened in the 16th and 17th century and was really not a good time to be alive if you were Catholic. List first says, Britain has been trying to rebrand its historical image with tea and monocles, though it's hard to do given how violent its history has been. We're not even talking about the colonies here. A civilian in Old Britain may die in a variety of ways depending on the time period. The worst, however, would have probably been during the Catholic Rebellion and their eventual persecution. It was generally a time of upheaval in Europe, largely over the question of which kind of Christianity is the best one. The situation was especially bad in England as the ruling Protestants really did not like the Catholic population. If you were suspected of being a Catholic or harboring one, there were a number of creatively horrifying ways you could die. One woman was slowly and publicly crushed to death simply for refusing to talk when she was questioned for supporting the Catholics. You could be drawn and quartered, hung, or just lynched by a mob. The mob thing was rare as the central authorities made sure to intervene and kill you themselves before the situation got so out of hands. How nice of them. Yeah, so just a casual death by public crushing for maybe supporting Catholicism. This is a time in history that I feel doesn't get brought up nearly enough based on what happened. In all honesty, I didn't even really know about this time until I started doing some research for this video. Maybe that is because the British government has tried to do a full rebrand and doesn't really want to bring up the dark past of what was once one of the worst times to be alive. Throughout history, people have consistently been persecuted for their beliefs and how they want to live their lives. This was one of the worst examples of that in history. 
and it's definitely not a time that you would have wanted to be alive. Number four on this list is the Siege of Sarajevo. This time really isn't that far off from us at all, folks. This siege took place from 1992 to 1996. Sarajevo is the capital of Bosnia, and had you have lived in this place during that time, life would have been hell. List first says, sieges are an overall bad time to be in, and we highly recommend not being in one if it could be helped. Some of the most prolonged sieges in history, like the Siege of Leningrad, have been huge humanitarian disasters too, as sieges primarily affect the citizens. One particularly horrifying siege that isn't mentioned that often is the Siege of Sarajevo by the Serbs, which is also the longest siege of a capital city in modern history. It went on for almost four years, and close to 14,000 people ended up dying. If the incessant shelling on primarily civilian areas like the market didn't get you, you could die in many other ways. People were dying just from the harsh cold as there were no fuel supplies in many parts of the city. Quite a few of them had to move into shared spaces with other families without any amenities, turning an otherwise functioning city into a giant refugee camp. Many people were killed by snipers who deliberately targeted civilians. Think about being a citizen in that city during that time. Your entire life is literally just about surviving at that point. And not just for a week or for a month, for literally four years. Four years of constant attack in horrible conditions to live in. Four years of fearing that you and your family are going to be killed. Four years of freezing and having no good food to eat at all. And this literally happened not that long ago, guys. This just as easily could have been one of us that was caught living there. You were just in the wrong place in the wrong time and now your life is uprooted and you need to fight to stay alive. Number three on this list is the Sengoku period. This was a period that took place in Japan from about 1467 to 1600. List verse says, the Sengoku period lasting over 100 years was one of the most defining parts of Japanese history, as well as one of the most influential. A lot of historical Japanese pop culture is set in that period as it was a time of consistent war and rapidly shifting political climate. There were more warlords fighting for territory than you could count, as the central power of the shogun had weakened in recent times. For someone living in that period, war and suffering would have been part of your daily life. Apart from opposing factions regularly raiding villages and towns for supplies, civilians were often caught between battles they had nothing to do with. Of course, that wasn't the case in every village across Japan, as many of them thrived due to the shifting landscape too. For those caught between the battles or just lost in the vast swamp, swaths of ungoverned Japanese territory though, it was a dangerous time to be in. The period was noteworthy for its brutality and general disregard for human life and gave way to some of the most fearsome samurai warriors in Japanese history. There are a few documentaries on this time period of Japan, and they are all very informative and super interesting. It's pretty neat to look back now and see what was going on, but back then, having to live through it, that would have been horrible. It really was like a massive game of risk that everyone was playing. And even if you were just a farmer trying to survive, it didn't matter. You were now caught up in this massive game of risk, and your life was constantly on the line. Number two on this list is the Roman Empire. Okay, wait, wait, I thought the Roman Empire was supposed to be one of the greatest empires ever. Well, it was. And if you were one of the leaders or a member of the elite class during this time, then you were laughing. But for some, it wasn't as nice. Specifically, the miners. The Roman Empire had a lot of slaves, mostly people that were taken from conquered territories and forced to work for the Romans. The worst possible place that you could be sent, though, was the mines. If you were a slave and you got sent to the Roman Empire mines, then life, it's about to get horribly bad. The conditions were awful down there. Mining was relatively new back then and there wasn't really any advanced technology to help these people. Not that they would have received any help anyways though. The Romans were brutal to these people and specifically handpicked people they didn't like to be sent down there. Disease was widespread because people were literally worked to death and never cleaned. They were given very little food and if they weren't producing quick enough, then they would just be killed. And oftentimes, these killings were of amusement to the guards as well and they would mutilate you or throw you in a pit with a hungry wild animal. There were literally no redeeming qualities to the mines at all and you probably wished for death if you got sent there. And finally, number one on this list 
is the year 536. Kind of a specific year here, folks, but from what I've heard, it was literally the worst. This verse says, when us laymen talk about the worst times in history, we're thinking of stuff like violence and proximity to cannibalism. We don't have any scientific parameters to measure how bad a time is for the people living in it, though we can make educated guesses. When it comes to actual scientists though, they don't bother with guesses or estimates and have calculated the exact year it was the worst time to be alive in history, the year 536. Apart from the falling empires the world over and general political chaos, the year 536 also marked one of the worst global famines in human history. The famine was due to ash in the air blocking the sunlight, which isn't surprising as there were also quite a few humongous volcanic eruptions around that time for good measure. The foggy eclipse of the sun, as it was described then, was visible everywhere in the world, giving the whole thing an even creepier vibe. Combine that with brutal conflicts in many places around the world, and you know why the researchers chose the year 536 to be the absolute worst one in history. So basically, year 536 was just hell on earth. Everyone was either dying or fighting, or they were dying of not having any food at all. It's kind of crazy to think that only a few thousand years ago, this could have been us. Nowadays, farming is so advanced that most of us are in a pretty good place when it comes to food, but back then, if the river dried up or the sun didn't come out, that was it, guys. We just aren't going to be eating anymore. Just be thankful that the year is 2022 right now and not 536. Starting off at number 5, Robert Wadlow. Often referred to as the Alton Giant or the Alton, Illinois Giant, Robert Wadlow holds the title of tallest person in recorded history, with his max height sitting at 8 feet 11 inches tall. Born on February 22, 1918 in Alton, Illinois, Wadlow's extraordinary height was attributed to hypertrophy of his pituitary gland, which results in an immense increase of human growth hormones, otherwise known as gigantism. From a very young age, it was evident that Robert was no ordinary child. At just 6 months old, he was already taller and heavier than most infants his age. As he grew older, his height accelerated at an alarm rate due to his excessive growth hormone production. By the time he turned 8, Robert was already 6 feet 2 inches tall, and his remarkable growth trajectory showed no signs of slowing down. While for some this may sound like a dream, the towering height came with a long list of challenges, as Wadlow had to face numerous physical difficulties and social obstacles. Finding suitable clothing and footwear was an ongoing struggle for the giant, often requiring custom-made items to accommodate his size 37 shoes and 811 stature. Despite these challenges, Wadlow faced his circumstances with grace and humility, endearing himself to people wherever he went. However, as Wadlow grew older, his massive size became an ever-increasing burden. His body struggled to support itself, causing chronic pain and discomfort. He would even have to wear a leg brace and a cane just to support his oversized legs, suffering by simply standing upright. Furthermore, the fame that came with his colossal height was a double-edged sword. While people marveled at his size, they rarely saw the lonely and broken soul that lay beneath. His life became a parade, a circus act as he was put on display like a sideshow attraction. He was robbed of privacy, forced to perform like a circus animal, and was never truly seen as a human being. Despite his attempts to lead a normal life, the world wouldn't let him forget the elephant in the room. Every step he took was met with stares and whispers. Genuine connections were elusive, as people couldn't look beyond his abnormality. Even as he tried to pursue education and dreams, he was met with skepticism and ridicule, overshadowed by his monstrous appearance. The constant pressure of being a public figure, combined with his debilitating health issues, took a toll on Robert Wadlow's mental and emotional well-being. The darkness within him grew, a deep sadness that was difficult to comprehend. He found solid and charity work, attempting to find purpose in his pain, but it was a fleeting respite from the reality of his existence. His short life came to a devastating end when an infection caused by an ill-fitting leg brace led to his untimely death on July 15, 1940. He was only 22 years old. The world mourned the loss of a giant, but few truly understood the magnitude of his suffering. In death, he found the peace that he was missing in life, but his tragic story remains etched in history, haunting those who dare to reflect on the dark side of our humanity. Next at number 4. Atlas. Atlas was a titan who once fought in the Titanomachy, a war between the gods and titans of Greek myth over who would have dominion over the universe. 
It ended in the victory of the Greek gods and left the Titans at a loss, with those who survived to face all sorts of punishments. While many of the Titans were condemned to Tartarus, Atlas in particular was condemned to something far more sinister. His fate was to hold up the heavens itself, the weight of the celestial sphere pressing down upon his massive shoulders. Atlas was cast into the desolation of the western edge of the world, a realm cloaked in perpetual night, where the very fabric of reality seemed to fray. Here Atlas stood, his once majestic form reduced to a grotesque monument of his transgressions. His immense shoulders sagged under the crushing weight of the sphere, a sinister quilt of stars and galaxies that bore down upon him with a malevolence that defied mortal comprehension. The heavens themselves, once a source of wonder and awe, became instruments of torment, a constant reminder of his defiance and its dire consequences. He was given relief of his duties only once, when the demigod Heracles needed his help in completing one of his twelve divine labors. Heracles sought the golden apples of Hesperides, said to grant immortality to whomever ate them. But to reach these sacred fruits, one must first navigate the treacherous, labyrinthine depths of the realm where Atlas stood sentinel, burdened by his eternal penance. Heracles asked Atlas to retrieve the apples for him as he took up his celestial burden while waiting, finally a break from his ceaseless agony. But upon retrieving them, thinking he was free, Heracles tricked Atlas, asking the Titan to hold the heavens for a brief moment while he readjusted his cloak, placing the eternal burden back on Atlas once again. He would then have another encounter with Perseus, yes, like Percy Jackson, in which the demigod asks Atlas to use his realm for shelter, but is refused due to his lack of trust after being tricked by Heracles. In response, Perseus would turn Atlas to stone using the head of Medusa. But this didn't just turn him into a statue but an entire mountain range, with Atlas's head as the peak, his shoulders the ridges, and his hair the lush forestry. This mountain range is now known as Atlas Mountains, located in North Africa, where he continues to hold the heavens, even as stone. The mountain range is super pretty though, so thanks Percy. Oh, and if you guys are liking the video so far, why not press that thumbs up, it'll help us out in the long run. Coming in at number three is Emperor Maximinus. Emperor Gaius Julius Verus Maximinus Augustus, also known as Maximinus Thrax, looms in history as a towering figure whose brief and brutal reign sent shockwaves through the Roman Empire. Born in 173 AD to humble origins, he rose through the ranks of the Roman army, eventually ascending to the highest seat of power in a manner that reflected the turbulence of his era. Maximinus had an imposing stature that set him apart. Standing at eight feet tall, he was a physical embodiment of raw strength and discipline. Brandishing both military and physical prowess, he was able to earn the loyalty of legions of men that he would wield to ascend to the imperial throne. In the year 235 AD, the Roman Empire found itself in the throes of a crisis. The assassination of Emperor Alexander plunged the realm into disarray, and the legions stationed along the Rhine River proclaimed Maximinus as emperor. His rise marked a stark departure from the traditional Roman aristocracy. He was a soldier emperor, devoid of the refined upbringing that characterized many of his predecessors. Maximinus's iron-fisted rule plunged the Roman world into a relentless nightmare of brutality and dread. Emerging from the rank and file as a common soldier, his origins seemed to etch a chilling cruelty into his very being. He reigned as a merciless despot, demanding an unwavering submission that crushed spirits beneath the weight of his ruthless grip. His subjects were shackled, not only literally, but by heavy taxation and by labor that drained the very life force from their veins, turning them into hollow shells of existence. As Maximinus turned his gaze outward to safeguard the empire's borders, the very heart of his dominion festered with discontent and strife. The relentless clash of swords and shields against distant foes reverberated through the land, drowning out the anguished cries of those oppressed within. Uprisings and rebellions festered like wounds, each region a cauldron of seething resentment against his oppressive reign. The climax of Maximinus's dark saga unfolded in 238 AD, as whispers of his tyrannical reign clawed their way into the ears of discontented factions. A nightmarish coalition took form, forged in desperation. Senators, local militias, and rival claimants to the throne converged like shadows, their collective anger igniting a tempest that bore down upon the emperor. Caught in the tightening rope of insurrection, he faced his reckoning in a maelstrom of conflict and chaos. Something that was bound to happen after his tyrannical rule. But honestly, I just wonder how they pulled it off. I mean, the guy was over eight feet tall. They must have stood on each other's shoulders to fight him or something making the most deadly game of chicken fighting ever. Moving on to number two is Gog Magog. Gog Magog, an ancient and malevolent figure in British mythology, rises from the shadowed depths of legend like a harbinger of doom. As a monstrous giant, his very name reverberates an unsettling resonance that sends shivers down the spine. 
Celtic lore describes Gog Magog as one of the last true giants to roam the land. Born from the primeval soil, he stood as a grotesque titan. Legend has it that the giant crossed paths with Brutus of Troy, a hero who ventured to conquer Britain. The encounter between these two larger-than-life figures is a story of epic proportions, with Brutus at war with giants and Gog Magog at the forefront. But it gets interesting when the two finally clash. With Brutus wielding a mighty club, the encounter culminated in a long and violent duel between hero and giant. But the odds were stacked against the giant when Brutus called upon his companion, Corinius, who threw Gog Magog off a cliff in a wrestling match. Why Gog Magog didn't use his weapon in the fight is beyond me, but I digress. Troy later came to become the founder and first king of Britain, giving it its name. Britain, Brutus, I'm sure you hear it. However, even in death, Gog Magog's haunting presence endured, with fears of his return being a constant concern for Brutus and the people of his new kingdom. Did he actually return though? No. But I'm sure the concern was very real at the time. Now, the next giant may not be the biggest on this list, but his story is surely the most iconic of any. At number one is none other than Goliath. In the annals of biblical lore, this towering Philistine warrior emerges as a monstrous embodiment of terror, a force that defies mortal comprehension and challenges the very fabric of courage itself. Goliath, a colossal figure said to stand over nine feet tall, was a living testament to the darkest depths of human conflict. His armor-clad form, decked out in metal and leather, was an imposing silhouette that loomed over the battlefield. His very presence exuded an aura of malevolence, sending shivers down the spines of even the most valiant warriors. Day after day at war, would Goliath dominate his opponents, sending entire battalions running with his massive stature and unmatched combat skills. It was thought that Goliath was truly unstoppable, until his confrontation with a young man named David, a mere shepherd. Armed with nothing more than a slingshot and unwavering faith, David's defiance in the face of such a monstrous adversary defies logic. Like the sheer audacity of challenging Goliath without any combat experience still baffles many today. Upon facing the young David, Goliath would treat him like any other soldier, charging at him with his massive frame, blade in hand ready to strike. David, with a simple sling, steps forward, his gaze unwavering, and fires a single rock at the speeding giant. And by some miracle, it hits Goliath square in the face. No curveball, no changeup, nothing but gas. And Goliath dropped right there. He died. Scientists believe that Goliath reached his colossal size through the same hormone problem that Robert Wadlow had, which made his brain much more vulnerable. So a single rock to the forehead was actually enough to kill the big guy. The story of David and Goliath then became a tale of overcoming impossible odds and is considered to be the first ever underdog story. It's clear today that much fewer giants roam the earth like they did so many centuries ago. But these stories act as a reminder of how small we are not only in this great big universe, but on our own planet. Remember guys, there's always a bigger fish. Number five on this list is the pyramids. The Great Pyramids are located in Egypt and are some of the oldest structures on the entire planet. The pyramids are said to have been constructed over 4,500 years ago and were made to act as the burial grounds for the pharaohs of Egypt. The Great Pyramid, which is the biggest of all of them, is over 450 feet tall with a base of over 750 feet wide. That's a really big structure and acted as the largest structure on Earth for almost 4,000 years. It should also be noted that the pyramids are made up of massive stone blocks. For the Great Pyramid, it's estimated that 2.3 million stone blocks are what keep it standing to this day. Every block of the Great Pyramid also weighs approximately 2.5 to 15 tons. Just a reminder that a ton is 2,000 pounds, so there were some blocks that could have weighed close to 30,000 pounds. All of this is completely unbelievable. So unbelievable, in fact, that people think something else might have been at play in making them. It's currently believed that these were made by humans. It took thousands of humans to construct, but when you think about how monstrous these creations are and the technology that humans had back in that day, it becomes very hard to believe that we were capable of doing that. This has led people to the theory of aliens. These pyramids are also built to face the precise magnetic north, which makes people wonder how the ancient Egyptians could have possibly got that information. The theory is that these aliens came down and built the pyramids and the ancient Egyptians mistook them for gods. This is why in some ancient Egyptian drawings we see gods flying around. The Daily Star also reports the speed of light is 299,792,458 meters per second and the geographic coordinates for the Great Pyramid 
coincide with that if you just move the decimal points over several spaces. They believe that this was a clue from the aliens for us to discover later. Frankly, as cool as aliens are, I would honestly rather believe that humans made the pyramids. It's pretty cool to know that almost 5,000 years ago, our species was able to make something like that. I feel like I have a little bit of pride for those ancient Egyptians. Number four on this list is the Bermuda Triangle. You've obviously heard about the Bermuda Triangle before and the lore that accompanies this extremely mysterious place. If you don't know what it is though, then the History Channel classifies it as a mythical section of the Atlantic Ocean roughly bounded by Miami, Bermuda, and Puerto Rico where dozens of ships and airplanes have disappeared. These disappearances have continued to this day but started hundreds of years ago. Basically since people started crossing over the Atlantic Ocean and records of ships were being kept. In fact, it's believed that William Shakespeare's The Tempest was based on a real shipwreck that happened at the Bermuda Triangle. So legends of this place can at least be dated back to when he wrote that play, which was in the early 1600s. In 1918, the legend of the Bermuda Triangle reached an all-time high when the USS Cyclops, a massive ship from the United States, sank to the bottom of the ocean. This ship was over 500 feet long and had over 300 people on board. It was a horrible catastrophe when it happened. What made this even more stupefying was that the ship had the capability to send out a distress signal and didn't do so, making everyone wonder what on earth happened. What has caused all these shipwrecks and plane crashes over the years is still unknown, but there are some theories. Some people believe that the Bermuda Triangle is home to a massive sea monster, potentially the Kraken or something like that. A massive tentacled monster with the ability to drag a ship down to the depths of the ocean and eat all who are on board. Some people believe that there may even be a wormhole that is out there in the middle of the ocean. A wormhole is a ripple through space time which experts believe would act as a portal to another time and dimension. The Bermuda Triangle has also been called the Devil's Triangle before, indicating that some people believe this place could be the work of the devil or some strong sea demons out there. Nobody really knows the true cause of the Bermuda Triangle. Triangle, and considering it's been talked about for hundreds of years, we may never know. Number three on this list is Stonehenge. Stonehenge is very similar to the pyramids having been built roughly 5,000 years ago and being so difficult to construct that people think some sort of paranormal events must have transpired. Located in Wiltshire, England, Stonehenge is a monument that features massive stones standing vertically that weigh roughly 25 tons. That's 50,000 pounds of weight that these monstrous stones have to them. The monument is oriented towards the sunrise on the summer solstice, but other than that, not a lot of people know why it's there or what its purpose was. Now it is owned by the crown and considered a heritage site, but still people wonder, why was it put there in the first place? Some theories involve its effect on sound waves. When two people are playing a pipe and you walk around the stones, then you'll notice an effect where they cancel each other out. Some people have even chalked it up as being an ancient sex symbol, believe it or not. However, the most popular theory is similar to the pyramids in believing that it's aliens. I tend to believe aliens were capable of this more than the periods, to be honest. They are certainly arranged in a strange fashion and they have no set purpose. How is it possible for humans to lug stones that are 50,000 pounds to a location where there aren't that many stones to begin with. Stonehenge just screams like the sort of place where something paranormal happened, in my opinion. Number two on this list is Jesus. I feel like this wouldn't be a complete list if I didn't include one of the most mysterious events that occur in all of history. Jesus lived 2,000 years ago during a tumultuous time. His life was one that we all remember and has inspired millions of people since he passed. His death is where something paranormal may have taken place though. Jesus died by crucifixion at the hands of the Romans. This was ordered by the governor Pilate who felt the pressures from the Roman people and felt like he had to give in to them. The crucifixion process lasted for over six hours apparently until Jesus finally gave his last breath. After he died, he was taken to his tomb which was closed off and shut by a massive stone. This tomb was guarded by several officers for days until on the third day it said that the rock moved and Jesus ascended from that tomb to heaven. His body was no longer in the tomb on this day and the belief that he went to heaven spread throughout the land. Now a question a lot of people ask is how do we know for sure that his body was gone and that tomb was actually empty? Now we know that because after he was gone and his followers were claiming he was resurrected, then the best way for the Romans to stop that theory would have been to produce the body which they were never capable of doing. So where did it go? Well, 
It's widely believed that Jesus ascended to heaven, that God acted and brought his son home to him. Maybe this event is less of a paranormal event and more of a miracle, but I still wanted to include it in this video. Number one on this list is the Dropa Stones. The legends of the Dropa Stones is a little bit up in the air, but if it is true, then there is certainly something paranormal afoot. The Dropa Stones are a collection of 716 circular discs that are said to be over 12,000 years old. They have very strange markings on them in a language that hardly anyone is familiar with. These stones were apparently discovered by Chu Pei Te, a Chinese archaeologist in the 1930s who found them inside some abandoned caves. They made their way to a translator who was able to decipher some of the markings and learn that they were referring to humans and aliens. So the theory is that aliens were present 12,000 years ago and had some serious interactions with humans back then. Now there are a few reasons why we can't take this as being full fact. One. It's possible that the translator who was in charge of deciphering them is wrong. We can't say for sure that they're familiar with the intricacies of language 12,000 years ago. Number two is that today, nobody knows where these stones have gone. They aren't in a museum and their location is unknown. And this is really hard to believe considering there are 716 of them and they would have been one of the biggest archaeological finds in years. All of this being said though, if these stones are real and our translator was correct, then that is undeniable proof of an alien presence from 12,000 years ago, which is pretty cool to think about. Number five, Robert Liston. I figured I'd start with Robert Liston since he's a bit of an outlier on this list. Because unlike the other ones, I don't know if he was truly evil, but he just enjoyed life much differently than the rest of us. You see, Robert Liston was a Scottish surgeon in the 19th century who had a pretty notable reputation. He was the fastest blade in the West End. He boasted that no one could slice and dice faster than he could if the legends about him are to be believed. He was allegedly able to perform a full amputation of a limb in three minutes, only losing one out of every ten patients, which honestly, all things considered, is actually a pretty impressive feat if not an absolutely terrifying one to think about. Liston didn't really have bedside manner to speak of though, and he would take a glee in his work that kind of bordered on sadism. He wasn't a mad scientist plotting world domination, but he was a particularly odd fellow who really reveled in how good he was at removing people's limbs. Everybody's got a hobby, everybody's got something that makes them happy. One particularly grisly anecdote says he once severed a leg in under 30 seconds and gleefully laughed to his crowd of spectators, time me boys! So evil? I don't know, maybe not. Questionable? Absolutely. Would I hang out with this guy? Probably not while he was working. The issue with Liston is that while he definitely had speed, and no one could argue that, accuracy was not always his strongest suit. Frequently his rush work would result in his patients having unnecessary complications and conditions such as dying. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Liston has the world's only surgery with a 300% mortality rate. In one occasion, he was working so quickly and carelessly that he amputated his assistant's own fingers off while attempting to sever a leg. And as he was doing this, he swung the knife backwards and ended up hitting a spectator who fainted out of shock. The patient, the assistant, and the spectator all died a few days later, leading to the only surgery that managed to lead to the death of three people. That's. That's an impressive record, if nothing else. And my friends, if you'd like to hear more freaky stories, true crime, cryptid sightings, UFO conspiracies, and just about everything scary under the sun and above it, why don't you give Top 5 Scary a subscribe for the best scary content on the net and keep on screaming. All right, moving on. Number four, Jose Delgado. Do you think you could control a bull? I definitely don't. But Jose Delgado believed he could. He was a controversial researcher who believed that the best way to get an animal to behave was not by training it or teaching it a trick and giving it a treat every time it does the trick right, but to implant a series of electrodes into an animal's brain to be able to manually control it with a series of electroshocks. To make a lot of very complicated neuroscience comically short in layman's terms, he was creating remote control monkeys. and. Do you kind of want one now? Because I kind of want one. Delgado signed on to Yale University sometime in the 1950s, where he set up his little shop in a lab tinkering with all sorts of fun electronic experiments and gizmos to research new methods of control. Oftentimes it was literally the flip of a switch that would alter the mood of a creature. The thing is, as scary as what he did, 
The results he was getting were unbelievable, stuff straight out of sci-fi. He was able to train monkeys by stimulating the parts of their brain that would activate aggression and he would teach them how to manipulate other monkeys that were threatening them by flipping the switches of their aggression. It's, it's nuts. Did you watch Westworld? I know you probably watched the first season at least, I've seen the viewership numbers. You know how in that show they could use those little tablets to open up like a cowboy robot's personality and alter all those stats like aggression, romance, bravery, etc, etc. Well that's kind of what Delgado was doing only on chimps instead of Evan Rachel Wood. One controversial experiment involved generating a painful sensation in a chimps brain every time it produced a particular brain signal which eventually led to the chimp learning not to think like that. Woof. Delgado's most infamous trial though was the one I mentioned at the beginning, stopping a bull in its tracks. He stood in front of a bull and like the matadors of legend, stared it down and used a shortwave radio and a series of electrodes to freeze it in place. Johnny Knoxville would have loved that. Now despite the controversial nature of his work, which inspired quite a good amount of debate and discussion about ethics, Delgado maintained up until his dying day that the work he was doing was for the benefit of mankind. He wasn't trying to develop mind control Control, nor did he see his experiments as a way to influence people, but rather he saw his work as a way to overcome mental illness eventually, and cure brain disorders, and also probably save the lives of a lot of bullfighters. Number 3, Giovanni Aldini. So I don't want to spoil too much about this guy right away, but all I'll say is that Giovanni Aldini would end up being the source of inspiration for the character of Victor Frankenstein from Mary Shelley's famous sci-fi novel. So you can probably sort of guess what kind of things this guy was gonna get up to without even having to listen to the next two minutes, but I'm sure you're very curious, so I'll explain it to you in great detail anyway. As a young boy, Giovanni was fascinated by his uncle, who was also a physician, and would watch him perform strange experiments. His uncle had an interest in reanimating the dead to see if it was possible to restore vigor to an animal that had passed, and he primarily tested on frogs, where he would attach electrical currents to them. These events, unsurprisingly, surprisingly would very profoundly affect Giovanni, who sought out to recreate what his uncle had started only on a much, much bigger target. It's man, it's man if you couldn't figure that out by now. As he grew older, Giovanni followed in his uncle's footsteps, zapping frog corpses, moving up to trying to reanimate a bull's head, until ultimately earning his place in mad science history when he started to begin his trials on humans. He sourced his bodies from executed prisoners, thinking, hey, they're done with them, I might as well use them. Trouble was that Italy tended to prefer execution methods that involved the head and the body going in separate directions, although Giovanni made use of this as well. He discovered that with an electric current, he could make a patient's face contort and this was on a head detached from a body. There's a terrifying mental image for you for the day. It was then when he started sourcing prisoners bodies from England that he started to inch closer and closer to that goal of reanimation. He asked for a body as fresh as possible and he got one George Foster. Not the one who played for the Reds though. Attaching probes to this body astoundingly. He got the man to open an eye, shake his jaw, and seemingly take a breath. This would end up being his last experiment, however, and he deemed the experiment a failure because the thing didn't sprung the life Frankenstein style. Chin up! I bet you'd love to know that your legacy was inspiring one of the most famous horror stories ever about a lunatic doctor who electrifies a corpse. Number 2, Albert Krigman. Now I feel like it bears mentioning before I even talk about all the twisted weird stuff that he did to earn his place in this list of evil scientists that Krigman just sounds like an evil scientist name, does it not? Like if you were writing a movie script, Krigman would be the stand in name for your evil scientist before you could come up with a better one. Anyway, I digress. Dr. Albert Krigman was a dermatologist who was commissioned by Dow Jones and the US Army to research the effects of chemical compounds on human skin. Oh, yep, this is not going anywhere good. It goes without saying, but like he wasn't checking for head and shoulders 3-in-1 conditioner. Krigman was offered a modest lump sum of 10 grand in grant money to research, and he set up shop right away in Holmesburg Prison in Philadelphia, where he got a near endless supply of test subjects or victims to experiment on with very little regard for their safety or hygiene. It was documented that the experiments at Holmesburg Prison included hair transplants, implementation of foreign bodies, burns and radiation of the skin, exposure to dioxin, application and ingestion of toxic and near lethal doses of acne medicine, and the yanking of fingernails. Ugh. I completely understand if you need a moment to just kind of catch yourself in editors. I'm so sorry for the pictures you guys are looking at for this video. 
You guys work hard. All right, let's get back to talking about stomach churning evil done in the name of science. One of the main compounds Krigman researched that I listed off in that little uh, list before was dioxin, the main ingredient of Agent Orange, the infamously evil chemical weapon the USA used during the Vietnam War. Inmates would be scarred, left sick with permanently disfiguring skin conditions leading to very painful side effects. Oftentimes too, many subjects were exposed to all sorts of contaminants and other infections from other conditions he was doing, other experiments he was doing. He did not keep a clean workspace. Krigman destroyed many of the notes from his research, but through testaments from his victims, we know the truth of what he got up to. While there were attempts to get justice after the fact for what the inmates experienced, Krigman himself lived to the age of 93 and never faced any sort of consequences whatsoever for his actions. In fact, the worst part is Krigman loved what he did. Take a listen to this spine chilling real quote from a real scientist who was really hired by the US Army. All I saw before me were acres of skin. It was like a farmer seeing a fertile field for the first time. That sounds like it's from one of the Saw movies. Are you kidding me? Okay, moving on. Somehow there's a guy who tops this. And finally, number one, Sidney Gottlieb. Unlike the other scientists on this list where I would offer a little bit of leeway onto whether or not you could truly consider them to be vile and evil outright or just, you know, a bit morally flexible in the name of progress, I actually feel very decent taking a stance and saying Sidney Gottlieb was pure evil. Gottlieb was an American chemist and spy master who helmed the CIA's infamous MK Ultra program. Surely if you've watched even two videos featuring me, you have heard me yell like a lunatic about the MK Ultra program. The CIA's very real, very well documented, very traceable mind control program that they were very really researching in the 60s and 70s. And this lovely son of a gun was behind most of it. Gottlieb Gottlieb is about as close to the pop culture definition of an evil scientist as you can get. He believed that there was a way to influence the human mind to ensure global domination for the United States. At the height of the Cold War, the CIA believed that China and Russia had advancements in mind control technology and they needed to catch up. Gottlieb was commissioned to run a series of experiments. Initially, the goal was to develop a truth serum. Gottlieb would experiment with just about every single illegal illicit substance you could on humans, most of the time without them knowing what he was doing. He tested on volunteers tears, prisoners, homeless, but most often people had no idea the nature of his experiments and he tended to pick people who had nothing left and had a lot to gain. After months and months of this left him unsatisfied, he was granted extra powers and resources for his experiments, gaining the full funding of the US Army. The goal of MK Ultra was to develop techniques that would crush the human psyche to the point that it would admit anything. Wow. This included torment like electroshock, sensory and sleep deprivation, all kinds of illicit substances, physical and mental damage, and so much more we can't even talk about. Eventually, the program was officially disbanded, citing that it was difficult to control the human psyche in this way. Godley would stick around, however, since he had a real taste for doing evil science and would helm the CIA's poison research division, looking into just about every way you could conceivably poison a human being, including one infamous poison cigar for one Fidel Castro. Godley retired in relative obscurity, never seeing any justice for his work, and lived out his days quietly in Virginia, largely forgotten by history. Well, not by me. Number five, the wow signal. In a 1959 paper, Cornell University's physicists had speculated that any extraterrestrial civilization attempting to communicate with radio signals might use a frequency of 1420 megahertz, which is naturally emitted by hydrogen, the most common element in the universe. In 1973, after completing an extensive survey of extra galactic radio sources, Ohio State University assigned the big ear to the scientific search for extraterrestrial intelligence famously known as SETI, giant dish. Think Jodie Foster in contact. 1977, Jeremy Amon, a SETI volunteer astronomer, was analyzing by hand large amounts of data processed by an old IBM computer. He spots a series of signal intensities and frequencies that left him and his colleagues astonished. The wow signal was the first radio signal detected from Earth. The signal came from the direction of the constellation Sagittarius. Eamon discovered the anomaly a few days later while reviewing the recorded data. Impressed by the result, on the computer printout, he circled 6EQUJ5 and wrote three letters beside it. Wow leading to the event's famous name. The signal lasted for the full 72 second window during which Big Ear was able to observe it, but has not been able to detect it since, despite several attempts by Eamon and others. It remains as 2020 the strongest candidate for an extraterrestrial radio transmission ever detected. To this day, nobody can explain the signal, even though many have tried claiming it could, could have just come from us. 
I don't know. What do you think? Number four, Harvard psilocybin experiments. Operation Midnight Climax, 1954, consisted of a series of CIA run safe houses and what went on inside them in San Francisco, California, and New York City. In 1960, two psychologists, Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert, ordered psilocybin from a Swiss company named Sandoz with the intention to test if different administration modes lead to different experiences. They believed that psilocybin could be the solution for the emotional problems of the human brain. The first test group was 38 people of various backgrounds. 167 subjects in total participated in the study, willing or unwilling. In 1961, Leary decided to orient the study towards psilocybin mushrooms and the rehabilitation of prison inmates. The San Francisco safe houses were closed in 1965, and the New York City safe houses soon followed in 1966. Operation Midnight Climax and Project MK Ultra were considered to be so secretive that few people, even of the highest government positions, knew of their existence. Midnight Climax being a sub-project of MK Ultra's The Mind Control Research Program that began in the late 1950s by Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, who was a chemist of the CIA. Unlike Project Artichoke, Operation Midnight Climax gave Gottlieb permission to test drugs on unknowing citizens, which made way for the legacy of this operation. Hundreds of federal agents, field operatives, and scientists worked on these programs before they were shut down in the mid-1960s. Hmm, science or sinister? Number three, Exercise Tiger. Exercise Tiger or Operation Tiger was a series of large-scale rehearsals for the D-Day invasion of Normandy 1944, in which the military's lack of communication resulted in friendly fire from an allied convoy being destroyed by German submarines, resulting in the deaths of at least 750 Americans. Wow. Of the two ships assigned to protect the convoy, only one was present. The second ship that was supposed to be present had been in a collision, suffered damage, and had to be repaired in secrecy. Because Allies' naval headquarters were operating on different frequencies, the American forces did not know this, and the first practice assault took place and was marked by an incident involving friendly fire. They didn't know it was an exercise. Set for 7.30 a.m., it was to include live ammunition to acclimatize the troops to the sights, sounds, and smells of war. This followed an order made by General Dwight Eisenhower, who felt that the men must be hardened by exposure to real battle conditions. Several of the ships landing that morning were delayed until 8.30 an hour later, and some landing craft didn't even receive word of the change at all. Landing on the beach at their original scheduled time, the second wave came under fire, suffering an unknown number of casualties. Rumors circulated along the fleet that as many as 450 men were killed and it remained in secrecy and classification memos for numerous years after. I've seen Saving Private Ryan and I can only imagine what this site looked like. Number two, the Manhattan Project. Nuclear fission by chemists in 1938 made the development of the atomic project a theoretical possibility. The Manhattan Project was a research and development exercise during World War II that produced the first nuclear weapons. It was led by the United States with the support of the United Kingdom and Canada. Nuclear physicist Robert Oppenheimer was the director of the Los Alamos laboratory that designed the actual explosives. The Army Component's first headquarters were in Manhattan, hence the name, the place name, and the official code name. The project began in 1939 and employed more than 130,000 people and cost nearly $2 billion to fund. Research and production took place at more than 30 sites across the US, United Kingdom, and Canada. During 1939, physicists drafted the Einstein-Sillard letter, which warned of the potentials of this extremely powerful creation of a new type. They had it signed by Albert Einstein and delivered to President Roosevelt. In 1941, President Roosevelt approved the atomic program and Roosevelt chose the army to run the project rather than the navy because the army had more experience with large budget scientific projects. Plutonium was then chemically separated from the uranium by scientists and the fat man and little boy implosion weapons were created at the Los Alamos laboratory in New Mexico. The first nuclear device ever detonated was the Trinity test conducted at New Mexico's Alamogordo Range 1945. Little Boy and Fat Man explosives were used a month later in the atomic droppings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In the immediate post-war years, the Manhattan Project conducted weapons testings, development of new weapons, promoted and supported medical research into radiology, and it maintained control over American atomic weapons research until the formation of the United States Atomic Energy Commission in 1947. Classified stuff, people. These were very scary times. And coming in at number one, the Philadelphia Experiment. This one scares me and I pray it really is a hoax because there's a lot of documents that relate to this subject around this time that don't really add up. 
The Philadelphia experiment was an alleged event witnessed by Carl Allen and the United States Navy shipyard in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in October 1943. Allen describes an experiment where the US Navy attempted to render itself invisible, cloaking the destroyer USS Eldridge and the bizarre scientific events and results that followed. On Allen's account, the destroyer was successfully made invisible, but the ship inexplicably teleported to Norfolk, Virginia for several minutes and then reappeared back in the Philadelphia yard. The ship's crew was supposed to have suffered various side effects including insanity, intangibility, and being frozen in place. The story first surfaced in late 1955 when Allen sent a book full of handwritten letters referring to the experiment to a US Navy research organization. The US Navy maintains that no such experiment was ever conducted, that the details of the story contradict well established facts about the USS Eldridge, and that the physics the experiments are claiming to be based on doesn't even exist. What do you think? I think this actually happened and the gruesome details of the side effects are just misinformation. I don't know. I get a weird feeling about this one. Too many science experiments at that time. Kicking off at number 5, The Divine Wind. And this one in particular is such a tale of historical significance that we just have to talk about it purely from an etymological perspective. Because you know that we all love words, right? Well, for those of you that do know, the term kamikaze actually translates to divine wind in Japanese, which is pretty metal anyway, but the actual reason behind that is something else entirely. Now over in the rich and intricate history of Asia, the Mongol Empire are a pretty big deal, although they are more inexplicably tied to the ancient kingdom of China than ancient Japan. However, that is not to say that the Japanese didn't have their own Mongol horde to face down. It's just, well, something incredibly interesting happened. And not only once, but twice. Let me explain. In 1274, Kublai Khan of the Mongol Empire sent a massive navy to conquer Japan with an estimated 30,000 to 40,000 men made up of Chinese and Korean warriors as well as the highly feared Mongol troops. The navy set off in the autumn of that year harrying the northern coastal islands of Kyushu. However, once the main fleet arrived and began to anchor in Hataka Bay, as the legend goes, a force of nature struck. A divine wind, a huge typhoon, emerged from the depths of the ocean, sinking a third of the Mongol fleet and sending the rest of them home. It was certainly a force of nature and it saved the Japanese ultimately from ruin. But the same thing happened again to everyone's divine amazement. Not happy with his failure, Kublai Khan sent a second fleet several years later in 1281, comprised of over 4,500 vessels and some 140,000 men. Again, sailing in August, the fleet made the once familiar voyage towards Japan and again this time the divine wind struck once more. I mean obviously there is a pinch of salt needed to this as is the formation of a Japanese legend but the symbology alone is startling. Again the fleet was devastated by a far more powerful typhoon than the last and over half of the evading force was cast into the bay perishing in the violent waters of the Pacific. The divine wind which once again as the legend tells it saved Japan from the Mongol Empire. However there is a caveat to this story. During their time preparing for the second Mongol invasion a 20 kilometer wall was ordered to be constructed as a means of defence. Despite holding off the Mongol Empire down to the divine act of the wind, the construction of this wall absolutely crippled the kingdom economically, ultimately leading to the shogunate's downfall. Hmm. Maybe there's a lesson there. Next up at number 3, Yiwa and Yemen. And of course, it can't be a list without ancient Japanese history unless there's a good old fashioned ghost story involved. And this one is perhaps the most legendary of them all. A tale of betrayal, murder and ghostly revenge adapted over 30 times in Japanese history and cinema and one of the underlying tales that forms the very unique aspect of Japanese horror to this day. Yotsuya Kaiden, but more specifically the story of Yuwa and Tamiyan Yemen. As the legend goes, Yuwa was a charming young woman who lived in a small town in Japan alongside her lover, Yemen, and although the pair were poor and had little money, they loved each other very much. Eventually they married, they had a child, and they were content in their standing in life. However, as time went on, the young Yemen became angry and depressed, surrounded by his reminder of his failures and his lack of prospects. Soon, he grew to hate Yua and instead began an affair with a rich young woman by the name of Yume. As time passed at the prospect of marrying into Yume's family for the wealth and riches, Yemen plotted to secretly poison his own wife. One night over dinner after he poisoned his wife's food, Yua pleaded with him to tell her what was wrong. The pair argued until late in the evening and then dejected and confused, Yoa eventually consumed the poison and Yemen watched as it slowly did its job. However, it didn't work as intended and instead of killing her, it grossly disfigured Yoa, contorting her into a shadow of her former self. Yemen was too much of a coward to finish the job and Yoa lived in pain and torment. And then one evening after taking his wife for a walk, he 
pushed her off a cliff when he realised that no one was around to notice. In public, he played the part of the victim, spending all of his money on a marital and pious funeral, knowing that his money troubles would soon be a thing of the past. Well, eventually on his wedding day to the wealthy Yume, when Yemen lifted the veil of his new bride, instead he saw his ex-wife's contorted and twisted face, poisoned by his own hand. It screamed betrayal at him, and in a panic, Yemen drew his sword and swung at the ghostly apparition. And then a severed head collapsed and rolled across the floor of the wedding ceremony, but it wasn't his ghostly ex-wife's head, but instead, the head of his new bride. Coming in at number two, The Standing Death of Benke. Wait, come on, you know what I'm gonna say, right? That's a pretty awesome title for a death metal album. Just saying, guys, another one to add to the pile. But really, the unbelievable tale of The Standing Death of Benke is just as awesome as it sounds. Between 1180 and 1185, a series of bloodthirsty and complex battles were fought in Japan, a period of history known as the Genpei War. Now, during this time, many lives were lost, but a legendary hero of Japanese folklore emerged. Minamoto no Yoshitsune, the renowned warrior that defeated the Haika clans. But this the story isn't so much concerned with Yoshitsune, but instead his most loyal of followers. Mushishibo Benkei, a man of mysterious birth who lived his life first as a monk, then a mountain hermit, and eventually the most badass warrior to have ever lived. He was one of the few men who would eventually earn the respect of Yoshitsune, and he did that by being an all around unrelenting badass, really. But it's not exactly in his life where Benkei achieved immortality, but instead in his death. Eventually, after the Genpei War had been settled for many years, history of course decided to repeat itself, and the same echoes of betrayal stirred throughout the warring clans of Japan. After falling out of favour with his half-brother, Yoshitsune retreated and sought refuge with the powerful northern Fujiwara clan for several years. By 1187 though, the patron of the Fujiwara clan had passed away of old age, and Yoshitsune's half-brother forced the clan into succumbing to his will. Eventually, his residence was surrounded by an impossibly large army, and yet one man stood in their way. Benkei, the final loyal warrior and follower of Yoshitsune, who guarded the one bridge that lay between his leader and the bloodthirsty army. It is said that during the battle, Benkei defeated more than 300 warriors single-handedly, allowing time for his leader to commit seppuku in his residence. Witnessing the unbridled bloodbath, the opposing force were terrified to approach, and instead began firing from a distance with a volley of arrows. One by one, arrow after arrow punched Benkei, but still, he didn't fall. As the legend goes, after the terrified army finally worked up the courage to come near him, they had found that Benkei had died from his many arrow wounds, yet he had died standing on his feet. And finally, coming in at number one spot, the 47 Ronin. And if you thought that the story of Benkei couldn't be topped, of course it can, because come on, this is Japan. Now, I don't say this lightly, but the legend of the 47 Ronin is perhaps one of the most important stories in Japanese culture, and certainly the most definitive of what it means to be a samurai. It exemplifies many traits that have been carved out of the thousands of years of Japanese history. And of course, as is the case with many important cultural tales, it has been adapted hundreds of times in both literature and cinema to varying degrees of success. And yes, I'm looking at you, Keanu Reeves. In the year 1701, the daimyo of the Eiko Domain, which was a sort of warlord, was a warrior named Asano Naganori, a legendary samurai who inspired his host of loyal samurais for many years, leading a group of over 300 men, all of them formidable warriors in ancient Japan. Now, during one trip to Edo, which is now Tokyo, Asano butted heads with a particularly corrupt and generally unlikable protocol master, a man named Kira Yoshinaka, who was accustomed to making people bend over backwards for him, despite the cultural importance of hospitality in Japan. You see, this kind of stuff just didn't fly with Asano, and after putting up with insult after insult, he finally drew his sword on Kira, wounding him in the process. Of course, in the capital though, this was very much a crime and one that was punishable by death. As a man of honour, Asano accepted his punishment and was ordered to commit seppuku as fit with his standing as a samurai. His clan of 300 men were disbanded, and Asano Naganori's estate was stripped of all holdings. But although the majority of his men would go off to wander the countryside masterless, a group of them couldn't accept this beseechment of honour. 47 of them, to be precise. The 47 Ronin, masterless samurai who would go on to plot their revenge for over two years, relentlessly training day after day, seeking seeking only one thing, justice for their wronged master and the death of Kira Yoshinaka. Well, on the 14th of December 1702, that is exactly what happened, and the 47 Ronin marched into Edo to Yoshinaka's mansion, who had assembled the city guard to defend him. The 47 Ronin fought like warrior poets, defeating Kira's force in the name of their fallen master, sustaining just two injuries in the process. One of them was a sprained ankle. Eventually, they found Kira, where they then cut off his head and carried it through the city of Edo to the grave of their master, Asano Naganori. Here the 47 Ronin place his head on Asano's grave, serving their final purpose, where they then turn themselves into the city. And then, moved by the impossible feat of loyalty displayed by the Ronin, the city allowed them to commit seppuku, restoring the honour of Asano Naganori and immortalising themselves forever in the legend of the 47 Ronin. Kicking off at number 5, 
the Mad Trapper. And regardless as to whether the true fear of this tale is as apparent as some of our other entries, nevertheless the perplexing story of the Mad Trapper of Rat River is awesome, if not an incredibly mysterious instance of forgotten history. Now Canadian history in particular is rife with tales of trapping and the fur trade that came with it, especially in the more remote parts of the Great White North. This daring portion of history has ushered in legendary feats of the mysterious men of the mountain, all of which pale in comparison to the mad trapper himself, Albert Johnson, a man with no history and no apparent record save for one of the most impossible instances of one man's refusal to be captured. As the legend goes, in early December of the year 1931, residents of the prime trapping site of Rat River had complained to the local Mounties that their traps had been sabotaged, ruining their haul for the season. The only suspect was the new man in town, Albert Johnson, who had mysteriously shown up a few months before without saying a word to anyone and built himself a cabin from scratch. As several of the Mounties paid him a visit to see what the fuss was about, Johnson wasn't in a talking mood and suddenly shot one of the the constables without warning. The man survived and the Mounties retreated but returned a month later, this time with more men and also a boatload of dynamite. When they thought they had the drop on him, the Mounties decided to blow up Johnson's cabin. But bad idea because as they entered the wreckage to presumably remove his corpse, Johnson emerged from a camouflaged foxhole and opened fire on the officers. He escaped and what followed was the most bizarre and impossible manhunt in Canadian history. The Inuit said of Johnson that at one point in the chase he was snowshoeing two miles for every mile that their dog sleighs could cover. At another point he scaled a 7,000 foot mountain with zero climbing gear during a blizzard. For over two months he lived off the land in the dead of winter without once starting a fire. However, when he was finally cornered and killed, which took an airplane and nine gunshot wounds, no one still had any idea who this guy was. Seemingly, he emerged from nowhere and returned back to it. But the strange legend of Albert Johnson still lives on. Coming in next at number 4, the ghost of Joe Baldwin. And any list of creepy tales from North America wouldn't be complete without some kind of ghostly yarn about the Great American Railroad. And perhaps none better is the otherwise tragic tale of Joe Baldwin and the mysterious Mako Lights of North Carolina, a phenomena of orbs and strange glowing lights that were seen near Mako Station for over a hundred years up until 1977. As the legend goes, Joe Baldwin was a veteran train worker and signalman, and on one tragic night in 1867, he was asleep at the rear of the freight when he was awoken by a strange rumbling sound. Joe realised instantly that his carriage had been detached from the rest of the train and quickly came to the stark realisation that his car was now coming to a stop on the middle of the tracks. Joe also knew that a huge passenger train was due closely behind them and in the dead of night if it careered into the stationary carriage everyone on board would be killed in a grisly collision. In one moment of heroic sacrifice Joe Baldwin clutched his lantern and climbed atop the carriage platform as the sound of the oncoming passenger train rumbled ever closer. Trying to catch the attention of the engineer, Baldwin frantically waved his lantern in the air and thankfully the engineer saw soon enough and slammed on the brakes saving everyone on board. That is save for Joe Baldwin who was still stood on the carriage platform and was gruesomely decapitated by the collision. Legend says that the force of the accident catapulted Joe's head off into the murky swamps that surrounded the tracks but it was never found. His headless body was buried with full honours as a hero who saved many lives, but for years following the accident, the strange Mako lights could be seen floating at night along the bleak span of railway. As the locals of North Carolina would warn for generations to come, it was the ghost of old Joe Baldwin, swinging his lantern, desperately searching for his own head. Swinging in at number 3, the hooded figurine. And for fans of long forgotten history, this one is equal parts bizarre and equal parts overwhelmingly eye opening. Now ancient North American history has been steeped in murky mystery and legend, particularly when it comes to the involvement of the Norsemen of Greenland, with the acknowledgement that the first and only confirmed Viking settlement in North America dates back to 1000 AD in Lance U Meadows in Newfoundland, supposedly the only of its kind until later European contact. But in 1978 after an archaeological 
archaeological dig of an ancient fuel settlement in Baffin Island, a strange carved wooden figurine was uncovered, which propositions seemed to take a much more mysterious turn. At first glance, the hooded figurine seemed to depict a person in a tunic with an etched cross symbol on the chest, first believed to be the depiction of a Greenland Viking, which seemed to correlate with the ancient Norse sagas of Helluland, a place that legend states was visited many, many times by Viking explorers, where they interacted with the native peoples and perhaps even traded. I mean, that alone is an insane enough notion, but this story has two parts to it, because several other researchers believe that the hooded figurine is instead a depiction of the legendary Knights Templar of the 13th and 14th centuries, which, if true, would have staggering implications to one particular enduring legend of the Knights Templar. As the story goes, after the Order of the Knights Templar were condemned and exiled from Europe by the Pope and King Philip IV in 1307, they fled to Scotland during the reign of Robert the Bruce, where they later fought in the Battle of Bannockburn. After living in exile for many years, the Order later befriended a man named Henry Sinclair, the first Earl of Orkney, who was said to have later sailed through the Atlantic with the Templars and their vast horde of religious relics and treasures, settling them on the coastal regions of Canada, where they disappeared from the records of history. Think what you will about this legend, and it's important to note that at best, the history and connection is incredibly murky. But you've got to admit, there is something strangely fitting about the hooded figurine, isn't there? Next up at number two, the Bell Witch. Perhaps one of the most renowned and haunting tales of the historical American South. In fact, the legend of the Bell Witch is perhaps one of the most notorious paranormal instances of American folklore, in the story of a malevolent spirit that tormented a Tennessee home over 200 years ago. In 1804, a man named John Bell and his family settled on 300 acres of land, which is now known as Adams, Tennessee. Here they built a homestead living relatively successfully off the land for over a decade, but in the summer of 1817, things started to change. Change. At first, it was odd noises, strange pounding of doors, slaps on the walls, the eerie rattling of chains. Sometime later, John Bell himself discovered an odd creature out in the fields, a strange hybrid of a dog, a rabbit, and something not quite natural. Soon enough, blankets began getting pulled from beds in the dead of night. People were getting scratched, kicked, and their hair twisted and pulled. The spirit soon identified itself to the family as the Bell Witch, a malevolent spirit that offered many explanations to who and what she was, all of which served to confuse things further. In some cases, she said her name was Kate Bat and had been wronged by John Bell in her former life. In others, she claimed to be an ancient American spirit whose burial mound had been disturbed by the family. Either way, the Bell Witch legend gathered so much notoriety that General Andrew Jackson himself paid the residents a visit, where on arrival his horse and wagon suddenly froze on the threshold of the Bell property. His horses strained tirelessly to pull the wagon, but to no avail, before Jackson himself cried out, that must be the Bell Bell Witch, and as legend goes, he heard a woman's voice whisper that they could then pass freely as they'd already amused her enough. Whatever the case, the cause of the Bell's torment over 200 years ago remains a complete and utter paranormal mystery, wrapped up in a terrifying and mystifying historical account of the paranormal. Maybe we'll never know, and it's probably for the best that we never do, isn't it? And finally, coming in at our number one spot, the starving time. And the fact of the matter remains, we have to end this particular historical list with one of the most violent, desperate, and gruesome instances in colonial American history. Now, in the early years of the continent settlement, they were trying times nonetheless, and for the first outpost of Jamestown, Virginia, the colonists there tried desperately to carve some semblance of life in order to survive in the New World. For years, though, there have been whispered through legend that the earliest American colonists had survived the harshest of conditions by turning to desperate measures, eating dogs, cats, rats, snakes, even shoe leather to stave off starvation. But as historians discovered in 2012, things were much, much worse than that. And after unearthing a hastily constructed burial pit of a 14-year-old girl, the first concrete evidence of cannibalism was discovered, leading to many later subsequent discoveries and the stark realization that the Jamestown settlers turned to cannibalism just to survive. Historians have traced back the bleak passage of history to one particularly deadly winter, a period known as 
the starving time that happened in Jamestown between 1609 and 1610, where settlers arrived during the worst drought in 800 years, catastrophically bringing fatal food shortages for the 6,000 or so people that lived in the Virginian settlement at the time. As history has found, it was a period of complete and utter misery, as the settlers were forced to dig up corpses from their graves in an attempt to eat when there was nothing else left. In one case, documented by the colony's most famous leader, Captain John Smith, one man murdered his pregnant wife in an attempt to salt and eat her, who was later executed by the settlers and presumably he was eaten too. Swinging in at number 4, the death of Hedingus. Now whilst there are many legendary Danish kings from history, the majority of them are renowned for their lives as bloodthirsty warriors and daring tacticians. Hedingus though, this guy is far more renowned for his death more so than anything else. Although to give him credit, he was a pretty legendary warrior and leader either way, it's just that well, you'll find out. From the off, Hedingus was thrust into a life of violent circumstance. His father, King Graham of Denmark, rocked up to the wedding of a Finnish princess, Signe, and her intended husband, Henry, King of Saxony. Obviously, it was love at first sight, as Graham killed Henry on the spot and then took Signe back to Denmark, where she eventually gave birth to their son, Hedingus. Obviously, Graham had quite a few enemies at this point and was quickly killed in turn, but Hedingus was smuggled out in secret to Sweden, where he was fostered by a giant, Wagnoftus, and his daughter, Hathgrepa. Now, this is where the story turns up a notch. You see, all Hedingus wanted to be was a warrior, but the giant Hathgrepa had other desires. Despite being his wet nurse, she eventually seduced him in his adolescence and became his lover. When he came of age, Hedingus decided to head back to Denmark, and the giantess, of course, came with him. On the way, they spent a night in a house whose inhabitants had just died, but as Hathgrepa was a sorceress, she cast a spell that caused one of the corpses to speak. Well, that corpse wasn't too happy and cursed them for eternity, telling them both how they would die. Not long afterward, Hathgrepa's death came true. She was torn to pieces by her fellow giants in a bloodthirsty frenzy. Hedingus went on in silence though and became the legendary king that he was worthy of being. His death he kept secret, seeking wisdom from his new patron, Odin. Eventually, after partaking in some mythical acts and winning countless wars until his old age, he brought his subjects to a forest to witness his new revelation. He claimed that only Odin knew his death and then he hung himself in front of everyone. Next up at number 3, the curse of Anvari's ring. And for this one we're going to dip a little into Norse mythology because let's face it, the history of the Scandinavian people was shaped by the skaldic tales that they formed their culture upon. And what if I also told you that the curse of Anvari's ring is also one of the many inspirations of none other than J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. Yeah, curse ring, Lord of the Rings. Alright, okay, maybe you saw that one coming. But still, in the original legend, one that is scarcely told but is integral to the Volsunga saga, the story focuses on the eponymous ring Anvaranot, or Anvari's gift, a fabled item that had the ability to make gold. Its creator, Anvari, which is Old Norse for careful one, was a dwarf that lived beneath a waterfall who had the primal power to transform himself into a fish at will. Using the power of the ring, Anvari stockpiled great wealth, but it drew the jealousy of the trickster god himself. Loki. You see, being the resourceful type that he was, Loki used a charm net to capture Anvari whilst he was transformed in a fish, and on condition of letting him go, he demanded the ring and his hoard of gold with it. You see, whilst Anvari reluctantly agreed, he also cursed the ring so that misfortune and peril would befall whosoever possessed it. And that's where the real bulk of this tale begins, because as so far as misfortune goes in Norse mythology, Anvari's ring is chasing the heels of Ragnarok in terms of individuals effective. First, Loki passed on the cursed ring to Hrymdar, king of the dwarves, for accidentally killing his son when he was transformed into an otter. Yeah, dwarves and transforming into animals is a pretty key motif here. Hrymdar was quickly hit by misfortune though when his own son, Fafnir, killed him and stole the ring where he fled to the mountains, transformed into a fiery and fearsome dragon to protect his hoard of gold. Hmm, where have we heard that one before? Fafnir didn't last long though, because soon enough the great hero Sigurd hunted down and killed Fafnir the dragon, taking his ring with him, who he gave to his beloved Brynhilda the shield maiden and Valkyrie, where the both of them spent years befallen with tragedy after tragedy. Eventually, Queen Grimhilda the dwarves tricked the couple into marrying into her own family, therefore bringing the curse of the ring full circle. Yeah, exactly. Rock and pool is nice and cool, our only wish to catch a fish. 
makes a bit more sense now, right? Coming in at number two, Lindisfarne. All right, okay, less mythology now and more actual historic atrocity. Lindisfarne, in many ways, is perhaps the most important date on the Viking calendar. In more ways than one, it was the birth of the Viking Age. It was the precursor to the many times that these Danish, Norwegian, and Swedish warriors would step foot on the shores of Britain, or, well, not quite Britain just yet. Not the mainland, anyway. You see, the holy island of Lindisfarne is a tidal island just off of the northeast coast of England in Northumberland. Here, it was the site of an incredibly important church in pagan Christianity. It was a peaceful and quiet place dedicated to the production of scripture by its humble monastery. In the year 793, it was said that several months before, foreboding omens came over the land of Northumbria. Whirlwinds fire at sea, lightning cracking from beyond the waves, and fiery dragons seen flying in the sky. These signs were followed by a great famine, and then on the 8th of June, the Vikings emerged from the mist. As a Northumbrian scholar of Charlemagne's court wrote, never before has such terror appeared in Britain as we have now suffered from a pagan race. The heathens poured out the blood of saints around the altar and trampled on the bodies of saints in the temple of God, like dung in the streets. You see, the English didn't know what had hit them. The Vikings had perfected the art of shipbuilding and navigation, and they had sailed to a land that they suspected would be filled with riches and resources ripe for the picking. And when they first emerged at Lindisfarne, where the only opposition was holy men in robes, it was like a hot knife through butter. The massacre at Lindisfarne was unprecedented, and in many ways it only served to further the Vikings' bloody reputation for centuries to come. It sent shockwaves to the rest of Europe, but as history teaches us, that wasn't the last of it. The slaughter at Lindisfarne ushered in a newfound frequency of Viking raids across the coast, as well as in Ireland and France, carving out a brand new period in Britain's bloody history. And finally, coming in at number one spot, the Blood Eagle. All right, talking of bloody history, our final entry on this list has to be perhaps the most notorious claim in Viking history. Throughout the many sagas of the Viking Age, one term struck more fear into the hearts of those that opposed the Dane law than anything else. Now, it's also important to note that the so called Blood Eagle, much like with many things of Norse legend, is possibly as much a fact as it is in fiction. In fact, many historians regard this particular torture method as being so bloodthirsty and grisly that it probably never even happened, but was instead used used as a cultural myth to strike fear into the hearts of the Vikings' enemies. I mean, that's also not to say that there are any several historical accounts, because there are, but yeah, just take this one with a pinch of salt. As the saga of Ragnar Lothbrok explains, Jarl Jaina went to Halfdan and carved Blood Eagle on his back. He thrust a sword into his trunk by the backbone and cut all the ribs away, from the backbone down to the loins, and drew the lungs out there. Yeah, that's a pretty bold statement. You see, one of the earliest accounts of the use of the Blood Eagle is attributed to the death of Ragnar Lothbrok himself. Back in 865, King Yela, who was the then King of Northumbria, had finally captured the legendary Viking leader Ragnar Lothbrok and sentenced him to death by throwing him into a pit of deadly snakes. And before anyone says that the United Kingdom doesn't have any deadly snakes, Yes, we do. It's the Adder, and they're incredibly poisonous. Anyway, in revenge for his death, the sons of Ragnar, led by Ivar the Boneless, led a Viking invasion a year or so later with King Yala in their sights. And once they finally found him following the Battle of York in 867, Viking legend maintains that Yala was tortured to death by each of Ragnar's sons by method of the Blood Eagle, where he was kept alive during the grisly and bloodthirsty punishment. You see, whether true or not, Yala was not the only one to have allegedly succumbed to the Blood Eagle, as many other figures throughout the sagas met the same grim fate. Either it was the most painful and vile punishment imaginable, or it was the scariest story ever told in ancient Nordic history. Either way, it worked. Number five on this list is the expeditions of Ernest Giles. Ernest Giles really only has himself to blame when it comes to his expeditions because he went on four separate ones. You'd think that he would have learned his lesson after the first one, but I guess not. Ernest Giles lived from 1835 to 1897 and was an explorer of Australia. Not much was known about Australia at this point other than the fact that it was pretty big. Ernest Giles wanted to shed some light on the country and made it his mission to explore the continent. His first expedition was in 1872 and was decently successful. Him and two other men wandered around the continent and discovered some interesting landmarks on the way. The second one wasn't nearly as well thought out though. Ernest set out on an expedition with one other man named Alfred Gibson. Apparently Alfred Gibson knew absolutely nothing about exploring in the desert though, so this was a pretty silly move to have this guy be your one partner. At the 8 month mark, the two were deep into the Australian wilderness when one of the horses died of thirst. This was pretty problematic and meant that one guy was either walking or getting left behind. 
Well, for Ernest, it was a little bit of both. Somehow they came to the conclusion that Alfred Gibson would take the horse and ride on ahead and Ernest would travel the rest on foot. The insane part about this though is that Ernest actually survived and Gibson didn't. Gibson was never heard or seen again and presumably perished in the desert. Whereas Ernest, after an 8 day walk with no food, carrying a massive cask of water on his back and hallucinating the entire way, managed to survive. The one piece of food that he had in the 8 day journey was a baby walleye and he wrote in his journal that he pounced upon it, ate it, living, raw, dying, fur, skin, bones, skull, and all. Guys, I'm totally cool with going on the occasional hike, but that whole thing, that's a bit extreme for me. Number four on this list is David Livingston's expedition. David Livingston lived from 1813 to 1873 and was a Scottish physician and also an explorer of Africa. He was notably most fascinated with the Nile River and where it came from. That's why in 1866 he decided to set out with a group of local guides on foot to discover where this river actually originated from. Clearly Livingston didn't conduct the hiring process well enough though because these guides, they weren't to be trusted. They led him for a time but soon started to become bored of this expedition and realized that they had all the power in this relationship. They abandoned him, with some of them even stealing a few of his supplies. When they got back to society and were asked about his whereabouts, they told everyone inquiring that he had just died in the jungle. This was a pretty bad situation for Livingston to find himself in, but it actually gets a lot worse. He trekked through the jungle by himself for a time, but eventually had completely run out of supplies and had to get assistance from someone. Lucky for him, there were some passing slave traders that used this route often. Unluckily for him though, they brought him to the village of Bambara. Clearly the villagers here were not accustomed to seeing a white person and were pretty shocked by this. They responded by taking Livingston and putting him into a zoo. That's right guys, David Livingston was put into a roped off cage so that he could be an attraction for those passing through the village. Finally, someone who knew Livingston heard of this man that was caged up and came to his rescue. When he got there though, Livingston wasn't in the best shape. Extremely malnourished, crippled, and currently dying of malaria, he definitely seen some better days. He was saved from the cage, but didn't last too much longer after that, eventually dying from disease. This story just goes to show you that if you're gonna get a guide, make sure it's somebody that you can trust. Number three on this list is the South Pole Expedition. Sir Ernest Shackleton was an Anglo-Irish Antarctic explorer who lived from 1874 to 1922. After hearing about his 1914 expedition to Antarctica though, it's actually a miracle that this guy made it all the way to 1922. The explorer had the goal of making it across Antarctica. They'd intended to take a ship, land on the continent, and then trek across it to the other side. What they were going to do when they got to the other side is anyone's guess, but luckily they never even needed to worry about that part. No, the issues for them happened far earlier. As they were sailing to Antarctica, they started slowing down and slowing down and slowing down until they finally stopped completely. They realized that the water around them had turned to ice and they were now frozen in place. Rather than get out and walk it, they decided to wait until the ice thawed and then they would keep going. They apparently sat on that ship waiting for this to happen for 10 months though. Then at the 10 month mark, the ice didn't break and their ship just actually sank. So now we have this group of explorers without much supplies stranded on the ice in the middle of an ocean. They were smart enough to save their lifeboat though and managed to take it and themselves to the nearest landmass. By this point, the expedition was completely ruined and now they just needed to focus on survival. They had to leave some men behind and Ernest and some other guys got got in a lifeboat and decided to sail it over 800 miles in the ocean. It should also be noted that this was during World War I, so if they ran into the wrong ship, then it could have all been over for them anyways. They made it to land and then they realized that to get to people, they actually needed to climb an entire mountain range. And believe it or not, they actually did and finally made it to some civilization on South Georgia Island. This expedition didn't lose as many men as some other ones, but pretty much anything that could go wrong did go wrong. The fact that anyone survived is truly pretty miraculous. Number two on this list is Ferdinand Magellan's expedition to the Philippines. So you probably remember the name Ferdinand Magellan from history class growing up. If you don't though, he was a Portuguese explorer best known for his expedition to the East Indies across the Pacific Ocean. The actual expedition resulted in completely new trade routes opening up and the discovery of the interoceanic passage. This was definitely a success, but it wasn't quite as nice for Magellan or most of his crew to be honest. Out of the 260 people that left, 
left for this expedition in 1519, only 18 actually survived and made it back home two years later. The biggest problem that took most of the lives of these explorers was food supplies. Back then, no one had any idea how big the ocean actually was and how long it would take them to sail across it. Therefore, the food and water that they brought along with them was woefully insufficient in feeding 260 men for an extended period of time. Several months went by on the high seas and the supplies started to wear thin. With no sign of land in sight, the crew had to resort to drastic measures. It started with crumbs that were filled with maggots, then moved on to cooked leather that was on the boat, then went straight to sawdust, and then finally to any rats that they could find. This was just for food though. For drink, they had to have yellow water. I feel like I don't need to explain what that is, but I can promise you that it wasn't pretty. Many people died from disease and malnourishment on the boat before they finally reached the Philippines. Here, they were attacked by a bunch of natives and Magellan was stabbed in the face with a spear. So I suppose that you could argue that this expedition wasn't cursed since they actually did reach their destination, but 18 out of 260 is a pretty rough ratio of survivors and drinking pee pee water Water while eating boat leather? I mean, that doesn't sound too great either. Number one on this list is the Spanish expedition to the Gulf of Mexico. Back in the early 1500s, there was a craze in Europe for acquiring gold. This was especially true about the gold in the Americas, this magical new land of resources that had recently been discovered. Well, Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, and yeah, that's his actual real name, was a Spanish explorer who wanted to get in on the action. He decided to organize an expedition to America right around where Florida is, get his share of the gold, come back to Spain, and be a rich man. This didn't work out the best for him or countless men that he decided to bring along though. The Spanish explorer managed to round up about 600 other Spaniards to come along in this expedition for gold. They set off from Spain and actually managed to cross the Atlantic without too much of a hitch. When they got to what's now the Dominican Republic in a layover, they did lose roughly 100 of the men though. Now this wasn't too bad because they still had about 500 and the 100 men just decided that they were done with the mission and wanted to stay in the Dominican, but it was the beginning of the bad luck for the remaining crew. After leaving this layover, they immediately got hit with a massive hurricane which killed tons of men and lots of their horses. Then when the remainder of the crew arrived in Florida, not only were lots of their supplies already lost, but they had to fight off countless waves of native attacks. They were losing miserably and had to get out, so apparently they broke down their weapons and supplies and tried to make some makeshift boats to get away from where they were. This actually worked for a little bit, right up until they got hit with another hurricane and fell into the sea. At that point, the roughly 80 men that survived this had to get to shore, but very quickly when they did, got enslaved by the native people that had been attacking them in the first place. Ten years later, four men managed to cross into a Spanish colony in Mexico, claiming that they were the only four men left from the initial expedition that set out a decade ago. Four men out of 600. I have no idea what cursed this expedition, but this thing, it was doomed the second they left Spain. Picking us off at number five, we have Blanche Monnier. This image was taken shortly after the discovery of a woman trapped in a room for over 25 years. 25. Half of her entire life spent in one room. This was no accident either. Also known as the confined woman of Poitiers, Blanche was secretly locked in a small room by her status obsessed mother. In 1874, when Blanche was 25, she wanted to marry an older lawyer. Being from a bourgeois family of old noble origins, her mother would not accept this. In order to keep her daughter away from marrying a supposedly penniless lawyer, she locked her in a dark room in the attic of their home. The family continued on living their daily lives, pretending to mourn the death of their captive sister. Imagine that, living out your life full well knowing that your poor sibling was tied to a bed upstairs, wasting away. Good lord. In 1901, an anonymous writer sent a letter to the Paris Attorney General letting them know about the spinster locked up in Madame Monnier's house. When discovered, Blanche was emaciated and filthy. According to some sources, she had not seen sunlight since being locked up. Living in her own filth, she was barely 25 kilograms. Imagine the sloth killing from David Fincher's Seven and you'll start to understand what this was like. The police reported that she had been lying completely naked on a rotten straw mattress, covered in a crust of excrement, meat, vegetables, fish, and rotten bread. The stench was so terrible they had to suspend the initial investigation and come back later to look further. The mother was arrested and died 15 days later. She knew exactly what she was doing, but didn't expect to be caught. Good 
riddance. Coming in at number four, we have Leonid Ragazov. While on an expedition to the Antarctic, Russian surgeon Leonid Ragazov started to feel awful. He was always tired, felt weak often, and couldn't shake a case of nausea. When he developed a sharp pain in his side, the medicine man knew what was happening. He had appendicitis. If left untreated, the swollen organ would kill him. Knowing they were far from civilization, Ragazov made the ghastly realization that he was the only person on this expedition capable of performing surgery. He wanted to live, and if the doctor died in an expedition, the others would be in great danger. So he did what most medical professionals consider impossible. He performed an auto appendectomy. He gathered some assistance, prepped his instruments, and began the procedure. If he were to lose consciousness, the helpers were instructed to inject him with adrenaline so he could keep going. Because of the nature of self surgery, he couldn't apply a general anesthetic. It would just cloud his mind and limit his abilities. So he had to cut into himself and deal with that pain. Once past the abdominal wall, he had to move his intestines out of the way and remove his appendix with no other pain relief. In the end, the surgery was a success. The image of the procedure underway is haunting to say the least, with Ragazov's open abdomen on full display. He actually performed much of the operation by touch, as the mirror he had planned on using to look inside ended up being more hindrance than help. Yikes. Kicking off at number 5, Stone Tongue. Which again is a pretty damn awesome name for a death metal band, right? But if you're a fan of this series, you'll already know that lists like these are literal golden skull mines for naming yourselves in all your death metal glory. So, metalheads that are looking for a band name, take note, please. And also, thank me later. Anyway, Stone Tongue. Let's first cast our gaze back to 1991 in Northamptonshire, Britain, where archaeologists discovered a gruesome and even stranger mutilation that emerged from the remains of Roman Britain. Now, it's no hidden secret that Britain is littered with instances of intrigue from the Roman occupation of Britain, but this one in particular seemingly doesn't fit any sort of logic or any of the many other mysteries of ancient Britain. At the bottom of a burial pit, buried beneath dozens of other bodies, archaeologists found the skeleton of a man whose tongue had apparently been amped amputated and instead replaced with a flat stone wedged into his mouth. The burial site at Stanwyck near the River Neen dates back from between the 3rd or 4th centuries, where people in Roman Britain would have congregated in small farming communities. Now, it's certainly not rare to find makeshift burial pits in Roman Britain, in fact they are a dime a dozen, but the strange thing was, this guy was buried at the bottom, face down. And not only was he buried face down, which would usually indicate some sort of fear of him by the community, but his tongue was cut out and replaced with a stone. As researchers noted, this was something that just hasn't ever been identified as a practice so far in archaeological records. There are no other known occurrences of this ever happening in Roman Britain, so far anyway. And the fact that this was on top of the matter of him being buried face down, well, who the hell was he? What was he doing? It is believed that the man would have been in his 30s at the time of his death, and one theory is that he had mental health issues and was actually responsible for severing his own tongue. Perhaps the tongue was the community symbolically making him whole again, but then why was he buried face down? Now, archaeologists are currently trying to correlate this practice to ancient Germanic laws, but its place in a small farming community in Roman Britain, yeah, that remains a complete and utter mystery. Swinging in at number four, Kat Shabib. And I absolutely love this one, as well as pretty much all of the next few entries, because nothing gets my mind worrying quite like an ancient structure that no one knows what the hell it is, or what it was doing, or why it was even there. Let me introduce you to the Kat Shabib, an ancient wall in southern Jordan that since its identification by British diplomat Sir Alec Kirkbride back in 1948 has had archaeologists scratching their heads ever since. I say identification because Kirkbride certainly didn't discover this structure per se, but instead he noticed that whilst he was flying over Jordan there was a very apparent and very clear line across the geographical landscape. A wall, in fact, that ran 150 kilometers, making it the longest linear archaeological site in Jordan. Now, why would anyone build a wall of such length? Now, the Romans had reason to with the Picts, ancient China had reason to with Genghis Khan, but Kat Shabib, what's that all about? The thing is though, whilst the purpose of this wall is the frantic subject of debate, we do know who built it. The semi-nomadic Bedouin people led by the Arab prince Amir Shabib. Historically, there is a certain recognition of the Bedouin people using the wall, but there is still no concrete evidence to determine its purpose. Archaeologists during the 1940s and 1950s argued that the Kat Shabib was used for military and defence purposes. However, there is a clear problem with that assumption. This wall 
is far too low for it to have ever been a successful defensive mechanism. And although it is massive in length, at best estimates it stood at around just a metre and a half high. What was it keeping out? Not a lot. So then why have archaeologists also discovered over 100 ruined towers across its span? Yeah, more and more questions. Oh, and also, did I mention that best estimates point toward it being built in the Iron Age? Yeah. Catch your bib, everybody. A complete and utter mystery. Next up, at number three, the Golan structure. All right, guys, if Catch your bib had you scratching your head, then the Golan structure is going to require some form of head scratching machinery. Let me introduce you to the Golan structure, also known as Rajum El Hiri, an ancient megalithic monument that resides in the Israeli occupied portion of Golan Heights, just off of the east coast of the Sea of Galilee. Made up of more than 42,000 basalt rocks arranged in concentric circles with a mound that is 15 foot tall at its centre, the Golan structure has often been referred to as the Stonehenge of the Levant. Why? Well, of course, because it dates back to at least the early Bronze Age to between 3000 and 2700 BCE. So what is it? Who built it? What purpose did it serve? Yeah, that'll be a, we don't have a freaking clue on pretty much all of those points. The outermost wall of this structure is 520 feet in diameter and 8 feet high. And since archaeological excavations have thus far yielded very few material remains, most Israeli archaeologists believe that this site was certainly not of a defensive position or a residential quarter, but most likely, as the vast majority of these enigmas are, it was a ritual centre. And not only that, but a ritual centre that is possibly linked to the cult of the dead. But on that note, there's even more of a mystery, because so far, no human remains have ever been found at the site, only objects pointing to its function as some kind of tomb. And also, hold on to your hats guys, because this is where it gets weirder, at the centre of the Golan structure, the actual entrance to a tomb was discovered, one that during the June and December solstices, its axis is perfectly aligned with. Yeah. More questions, fewer answers. The thing is though, as its namesake is the Stonehenge of the Levant, no other structures of its kind have ever been discovered, which is even more of a head scratcher considering the fact that in ancient Britain, as well as in South America, structures like this are pretty common. Some believe that its purpose was to worship Tammuz and Ishtar, the ancient Mesopotamian fertility gods. Others suggest that it was used by the Dakmas of the Zoroastrians to lay out their dead and let the birds remove the flesh from their bones. Some say that it was a calendar or a site to observe the constellations for religious calculations. Maybe it was all of these things at some point in time, but as it remains, we may never know. Coming in at number two, the Great Lakes Copper Mystery. Oh boy, here we go. If you're not already feeling perplexed at the mysteries of the ancient world, then I'm fairly certain that this one will knock your metaphorical socks off. In the wilds of Michigan's Isle Royal National Park, it remains a beautiful and remote location, but thousands of years ago, the island was home to a thriving mining industry. Yes, mining. The rich veins of copper that ripple through the site's bedrock certainly drew the attention of the early Native Americans, and the fact that they diligently used this ore to make tools and jewellery is evident still. But the actual extent of their operation remains a complete and utter mystery. Why? Well, because around six and a half thousand years ago, there is clear and startling evidence to suggest that roughly 500,000 tonnes of copper was mined from the land. 500,000 tonnes of copper, which simply put is a staggering amount. Now, the copper culture complex is an astounding feat of ancient civilization regardless, but here is where our mystery takes another turn. You know why? Because Michigan copper is some of the purest copper on the planet. Keep that thought in mind. And 500,000 tons of it, well frankly put, there should be more evidence to its use throughout the Midwest. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of a leap here, and I'm going to point us toward another ancient mystery, one that occurred off the coast of Turkey, roughly around the 14th century BC. A shipwreck that was discovered just off the east shore of Uluburun, discovered by a sponge diver back in 1982. Now, the Uluburun shipwreck is a bit of a mystery in and of itself, but it's with the content of its cargo that we're concerned with here. Within the hull of the shipwreck, over 10 tons of copper oxide ingots were discovered. Now, oxide ingots, which are named so down to the fact that they are shaped with rectangular handholds on either side, were relatively common in the late Bronze Age period of the Mediterranean Sea. You know what is weird? Testing on these ingots later discovered that they were extraordinarily pure for others of its kind. In fact, more than 99.5% pure. The oxides themselves were brittle blister copper with voids and slag bits that only occur when multiple 
pourings were made outdoors over wood fires. There is only one type of ore of this purity, Michigan copper, the kind mined over six and a half thousand years ago in the copper culture complex of North America. Yeah, beats me guys. And finally coming in at number one spot, the Ness of Brodgar. And I absolutely adore this particular Neolithic mystery. And at the moment, this is pretty much my direct inspiration for scholarly study of the ancient world. Now, we've covered this area quite a few times on this channel. And if you'd like to find out more about places like Scara Bray, the ancient site discovered on the Orkney Isles of Northern Scotland, then please check out our Scottish history list. And also, you know, do your own discovering because Neolithic Orkney is absolutely amazing. But there's another place that is even more remarkable than Skara Bray, the Ness of Brodgar, perhaps one of the most important discoveries in archaeological record depicting just what the hell was going on during the Neolithic period of ancient Britain. Now back in 2003, in a site that occupies the central position with the Orkney Archipelago that lies between the locks of Stenness and Haray, an imposing complex of monuments were discovered, a series of structures that seemingly were of pivotal importance to Neolithic Orcadians, and perhaps even even further afield, perhaps even the whole of ancient Britain. The site itself, which lies between the already discovered Ring of Brodgar, a Neolithic stone circle that has its own mysteries, as well as the equally mysterious stones of Stenness, dates back to at least 3300 BC. As of 2016, 14 structures have been discovered, with many of them being built on top of each other, suggesting perhaps an even older use of this site and a location of incredible importance to the Neolithic people of ancient Britain. Without a doubt though, the most impressive structure known as Structure 10, which appears to be a Neolithic pyramid, is even more of a head scratcher. Yeah, I just said Neolithic pyramid. Around this site, which was used prolifically up until around 2200 BCE, after which it abruptly stopped, archeologists have since discovered the bones of approximately 400 cattle, around, wi around which the carcasses of several red deer were placed, with many of their tibia bones being cracked and extracted for marrow, suggesting the site of a feast. Do you know what's weirder though? During this event, there is also evidence of the temple being largely destroyed, brick by brick. Seemingly, for some reason, the Neolithic Orcadians built this site as a place of incredible importance, used it for a thousand years, and then one day, threw a party and tore the whole thing down. I have no idea, guys, but most importantly, I wanna know.